I want to do today is, is we make so much discussion about race. And, and I think that that becomes one of the core things about the conversation. And we can't have a conversation about equity without having a real honest conversation about race. So I want to talk about what that is. I want to talk about its implication because that's what we talk about when we talk about inequities. It's a nice way to dance around some very, and this is going to get very uh, interesting as we go, go forward because what I want to try and do is define some of the origins of how this race consciousness came to be and why it is so ingrained in the interstices of all of, of, of what we have to deal with every day. So we want to talk about it. So I'm going to hear, you're going to hear me not talk about race. You're going to hear me talk about global white supremacy. And that's not my term. That's a term that you'll see in just a minute where that comes from. And then talk about the complexities around that. So what I'm going to do is start out with a history of race and then the relationship of race to racism. And then talk about equity. And what are the, one of the things I'm going to hope to do is give you a few video clips because what I want you to do in the video clips is look at them and decide how can you change, how do you structurally change these particular problems. And there are some policy issues that can be done, but at the core, if the policy makers are making the policy out of a racist con construct, then you get a policy that, does, that still reflects that paradigm. Does that make sense to you? So what I'm trying, that, that's where we're going to go with this. And that's not true. That's true if you anchor it in the Greco-Roman era. But if you move beyond the Greco-Roman era, Inhotep lived 2,400 years before Hippocrates ever came to the planet. And this man right here was responsible for doing over 200 operations. He treated multiple diseases of, I don't know why we're having this issue. It just keeps going back to this other screen for some reason. I've never had that happen before. But what I'm going to do is take this out and do it the old-fashioned way. No, that's all right. I'm okay. I'm okay because I'd rather, I'd rather just do it this way and not have to have any further interruptions. I can do it this way. It works just fine. So this gentleman did over 200 operations, and he broke down. And, and not only was he a physician, but he was a, 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 a physicist an astronomer and a priest, because the Egyptians did not see these things as separate disciplines, but all connected one to the other. I would suggest that you also watch a movie called The Journey of Man, which is a genetic odyssey. This is a geneticist who actually studied the DNA, starting with the Sun people in southern Africa, and traced the DNA markers along the male chromosome to every human in, on the planet. So the, the, the origin of man is, 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 as we all know, but now has been proven on more than one occasion to be uh, on, on the so-called African continent. And I say so-called African continent because when you use the term Africa, you are then putting a goalpost in your knowledge. Because Africa is not a name that the continent was called. It was called a Kabbalah, it was called Ethiopia, it was called all kinds of other things. But this became the name that was given after the, the Roman general, Cyprio Africanus, conquered the African continent. So it was called something way before that, and it had a history and a legacy and a science and a technology and a theology way before the, the Romans uh, ever came there. So if you looked at genetic variation among the people on the major continents, what you see in this Venn diagram is everybody has African genes. Everybody. Doesn't matter if you're so-called white, if you're whatever you are, you are a member of the, of the so-called African family. And it's important because this allows us to then start with a different construct by which we can begin to think about what we have to do. So when we look at this whole notion of race, it's a flawed, con it's a social construct. It's not biological, it's social. It is a socio-political construct that was started by this gentleman, Carl Van Lin Lin Linnaeus. He was the first one to do this, uh, this particular work called the System of Nature. And Blumenbach was the, word, the one who used the word race to classify humans in the five divisions. And you probably heard this before. Caucasoid, Mongoloid, 
he called Ethiopian, which was really another word for what I just talked about, and Malay. And he coined the term Caucasian because he believed that the people around the Caucasus Mountains were the most beautiful people in the world. That's how that came to be. And so, and the most, uh, the most beautiful race of men. But it is a flawed construct because there is no scientific basis that, that deals with race from a scientific point of view. 85% of all the genetic variation that occurs between people occurs between two people from the same so-called racial group. So if you look at it very, and I just showed you the Venn diagram that, that does this. So if we look at race in modern medicine and Mosby Guide to Physical Examination, which is what we used as I was coming up through medical school, along with other things, uh, was, was that it was a, it called race a physical but not a cultural differentiator. And it was really based on a, uh, what we call the common heredity. But that's even flawed because if it was really about a common heredity and everybody has an heredity that's based in being so-called African, then that's our common ancestry and common heredity. And we use these words. I mean, when I, when I was a medical student and we would present a patient, we would always say a 45-year-old black female. And we'd always use the race classification. And, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit as we go further. But this was, I thought, an interesting paper. And I would suggest that you all get this paper. This is a paper written by Ricky Lee Allen. And it was uh, published in Educational Theory. And it, he's at the University of New Mexico. But it was a real interesting paper to really make me think very differently about what we've been calling disparities, what we I mean, those are just coverings. They're not, they never get to the real root of the problem. And that's what I hope that uh, this, this, this course I'm going to take you through, which are excerpts from Ricky Lee's paper. And Ricky, in my mind, was the first person, and I've been doing this for some time, that really sort of put a real, what I call the real context of this whole conversation. So when we talk about white supremacy, uh, this is, it's a and this is the key word, global. It's not United States, it's not just, it's global. It's everywhere in the world. This is a construct that, does, that defined people who were defined as white. And early on, white was a term limited to only uh, Anglo-Saxons. Irish were not considered white. I mean, these were, these were it was a very, very de narrow definition. Early, later on, other people became identified. But the key here is that it's a system, not a, it's a system that confirms, confers un, unearned power and privilege to those who identify that way. And disprivilege and disempowerment to those who become identified as people of color. So Ricky talks about five different points. And I'm going to take you through these and a couple other things that I'm going to have my seat and sit down. But Ricky talks about these five, uh, five points. And the whole, this whole thing is very critical to understand why we see what we see, not only in America, but we see it in Haiti, and we see it in the Caribbean, and we see it in South America, and we see it on the African continent, and we see it all over the world, because this is the construct that defines it. So this history of European imperialism transform this whole global, this community of the white race. And so therefore, under this, people of color, whatever they, however they find it, the racialization, and that's what happened. We racialized biology, which was really not correct, and cultural practices, which was not also correct. But those people were the people that became enslaved, imprisoned, oppressed, and alienated. And it was founded on a very false principle that civilized was white and everything else was uncivilized. And why was that important? Because it became the underpinning guided by very powerful religious beliefs, especially in the Greco-Roman era, to create the justification for the brutal treatment of anyone who was not white. Therefore, they had not to respect it. They not had, didn't have to respect them as people, didn't have to respect their customs, didn't have to respect their cultures, didn't have to respect anything. So when we look at the civilizations of the Inca, if we look at the civilizations of the, 
of the Egyptians, or if you look at these other civilizations, this was the construct under which it could be made that those were primitive people, they were, they, although we found out that was not true, but really it was the justification that gave, gave the Europeans the right to go into these, their, their right in their mind, their mind, to go and enslave, slaughter, denigrate, do whatever they wanted to do to people who did not fit the classification of white. And the third, this third point, these nation states, these are the things that what we call colonies. So the English, colon, if you look at the English, the British, I'm sorry, the, the English, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they conquered many, many countries, particularly all over the world, not the least of which on the African country, on the so-called African continent. So, but so what happens is, when you, look, when you look through the eyes of global white supremacy, you begin to understand that the white sea world, the, the, the people who agree that, that that's what they are, see the world through this fog of what he calls the collective historical, historical geographical amnesia. In other words, they want to try to forget. And under the systems that they set up, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, what they did was they took the riches of those countries made them debtors, and then made them take all those ridges and deposit them in the banks of the colonized. Like, still today, many of the French colonies still have to hold all of their wealth in French banks, and then in order to take access of their money, they have to borrow money against their money at a higher interest rate from the French banks to do the things they need to do in their own countries. No, I'm just, this is just true. Don't take my word for this. Please, please, please research this for yourself so that you can see. So the stolen wealth, which was placed in European banks, became the wealth that was used to create imperialism all over the world, from one point of view. So this whole situation, when we start talking, this is why the reparations conversation never makes traction in America. Because they are generally oblivious or unconcerned. And I'm not saying, I'm not painting a broad paintbrush because I'm not saying every white person. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just talking about the system. Whether you benefit from it or you don't benefit from it is the system that we have to talk about. And I said, we just said, Dr. Mason, I thought you were going to talk about something else. This is a heavy topic for the first yeah. conference in the morning, but we need to understand it because I'm just tired of just getting up and giving these nice, simple, soft, pleasant conversations about race. Let's talk about it. And let's talk about it. And let's talk about it from the, the point of view from where it stems, and it's a global uh, system. So here it is. Localized instantations of global white supremacy, whites operate as the normalized body. That's the key, the normalized body. And so this membership is based on a shared idea that actively and necessarily constructs blindness to global white supremacy. You don't see it. You know, you look at it at a local level. We look at it at a local level. We look at, you know, all these things. You know, we talk about health disparities. Why do disparities in health exist? Because they're supposed to. They should not surprise anybody. How do you take a people that have been subject to this all over the world, especially in America, and then say that, uh, not, not until you know, their independence was declared in 1776, but in the United States, according to the United States Constitution, Africans or people of color were still slaves, and therefore property with no rights. It wasn't until so-called 1865, and I'll get to that, but it's important that we understand this history. So after more than 100 years after the 13th Amendment was passed, there were still Jim Crow restrictions placed and the Chinese Exclusion Act. Let's not forget that we interned many people of color, Chinese and Japanese, in America. And, they, and the courts upheld that particular activity. And you gotta remember, when you look at the, the, uh, uh, the decisions that were very landmark decisions that uh, took place in America, the Dred Scott decisions, for example, Justice Taney, who is the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, dismissed the case because it was without standing. And it was without standing, don't take my word for this, look it up yourself. 
it was without standing because in Justice Taney's mind, the, the black people, Africans, the United States Con Constitution was never meant to apply to black people. And therefore, this man could not sue. And they created this one drop rule. We didn't create this. And this is how they excluded certain other uh, categories. And this is all, again, all in this uh, same paper. And then we created a way to measure people coming up with these racialized definitions to count and measure and track where the people went. So if you ask, now jumping to the purpose of the slave trade, it's real simple. The purpose of the slave trade was to create a mechanism to provide almost 250 years of free labor to the United States of America. That free labor built this country. Cotton was the same now then as oil is today. So it was, this was the danger that happened. And so <clears throat> the 13th Amendment, which was passed and ratified in the 18, mid-1860s, allows, here's the thing that people don't remember, is that the, the 13th Amendment says that voluntary inservitude is illegal except except in the case where you duly convicted of a crime. So after, that, after the 13th Amendment was pushed up, 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 done this way, then there were a number of laws that came up, you may call them these Jim Crow laws and other laws, vagrancy laws and everything else, where blacks could still be arrested. And that, arrested, uh, that being arrested created a way to fill jails. Those jails and those people in those jails were then used to provide cheap labor in that, at that time. And that has not stopped. And so this was the, the distribution of the so-called slave trade, uh, where folks, in fact, more were dropped off, more of us were dropped off in, in, the, the, uh, in South America. But this is what I just talked about. So I'm gonna show you a little video uh, about this particular problem. Because this has been the way and the way that people get incarcerated, there was a big scare. I mean, if you have a memory, you remember crack, the big so-called crack epidemic. And we talked about the young doctor from Northwestern University who said that we were going to have generations of babies who were going to be crack addicted, and it was going to cost billions of dollars to take care of these people, all based on false science. It never happened. Where are they? The most dangerous drug that we have in America is alcohol. Now, not heroin, of course, we've got a heroin issue, but alcohol. alcohol. Alcohol creates more birth defects than any of these other drugs. Alcohol creates a situation called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And these kids have lifelong disabilities. And you should look it up. So anyway, this is a video that you could download from YouTube. And it talks about how the United States has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's jail population. It talks about how um, one in, at the current trends, one in three black men will spend time in the United States prison system. It also talks about how these prison, uh, how the United States prison systems have, have more people working in these prisons than any Fortune 500 company with the exception of General Motors. And that they make shoes, they make textiles, they, add, answer, they, they serve as call centers, they do all the jobs in prison that they can't get when they're out. And they're paid somewhere between 58 to $5 a day, 58 cents to $5 a day. So it's a, it's a real difficult situation. So let's keep going because I'm not going to deal with that. So this, this whole conversation about ethics to me is the, the conversation around, that we really ought to be having around um, equity. And these are, the, these are the things that I think ethics guides, what's considered justifiable homicide. In other words, when is it all right for one person to take the life of another? And all the other things that you see here. So I've got some, some things I want to go through. I don't know that we'll be able to do them now because some of them have little dialogue, or little boxes, I mean little things that we need to sort of here, but one of the things is when we, all of you, and you'll see, the, see mine in just a minute, but all of you have seen that equity, equality, box, you know the little cartoon, I'll show it to you if you haven't seen it. 
But the thing that I always say, that's a nice little cartoon, but how do you compensate for color? How do you do that? How do you make, how do you create a, a way to, to make the, the color piece go away? And so this is why I wanted, this is the, con the uh, little thing I was talking about. Here's equality, equity, and somebody added a, another box called reality. And we can see here, so if I had, to, if you had to come up with these little boxes, what would those little boxes be if you had to compensate for race? What, what, what goes in there? What policy system or environmental change would go with these? So I got, there's a few scenarios that I wanted to show you. I think that we're gonna have the same audio problem that we had before, but these are the elements that we have to think about. And how do you sustain these particular issues? So the other, so there's a couple of clips I wanted to show from um, different movies. Uh, one is from a, a thing called Na Unnatural Causes. And this was a clip from the Marshall Islands. And I've shown this so much, I can tell you what this is about. The United States government carried out atomic bomb testing in the Marshall Islands. And the way they had to do that, they had to go and convince the Marshallese to leave their islands. So the United States Army went and told the people in the Marshall Islands that it was the will of God that they leave their homes so that these bombs could be tested, these nuclear bombs could be tested in their, along the, the, the uh, islands, along the areas where their islands were located in order to, to help uh, guard against any kind of problem in the world. And they, re they relocated folks from the Marshall Islands, the other atolls within the Marshall Islands. And what, did they, what the video will show was that the, that the Marshall Islands, what happened was they miscalculated the dose of the force of the nuclear bombs. And the fallout from it not only destroyed all of the land, the fishing areas, it created this uh, places where people had tremendous high numbers of cancers. The, the Centers for Disease Control went in, and the background level of cancers was much, much higher for people in the Marshall Islands than should be expected. And the Marshallese had no way to eat their natural food. How am I doing on time? Okay. Had no way to eat their natural foods. And so, just as they did with another group I'm going to show you, the United States brought in these commodity foods from the commodity food program. Some of us know about the commodity food program. It's called government cheese. Yeah. Uh, but there were other things, gravy, peas and uh, beans and rice, or pork and gravy, flour, sugar, all, uh, juices. These were all the things from the commodity food program. And they began feeding this to the Marshall, Marshall Island people. This was not their natural diet. So guess what happened to them? The diabetes skyrocketed. All these other chronic diseases began to skyrocket. And then, and I'll show you if we get this other thing going, um, I'll show you in another clip that what did the, how did our government respond? They sent in a whole team of scientists to see if there was something genetically wrong. There was some genetic predisposition. And they spent a lot of money and they found absolutely no genetic predisposition. But it was really as it is right now, here in Chicago, and in the rest of the, this is why I'm going to the conference, that food, what we're eating, is 90% of the problem that we have. That's what it is. This particular, this is another one. This is from uh, the California Newsreel. It's called The House I Live In. And this is, a, uh, this, this is the housing policy. And what they found with, the, with housing was uh, that when people came back from the war, that they created the GI Bill, that they created these ways for low-income mortgages to be given to soldiers, but they were available on a race-restricted basis. Black soldiers could not get these. Now, I don't know why we would be surprised. Black soldiers couldn't go to the same bathrooms, couldn't sometimes serve on the same ships, and some could not even be buried in the same cemeteries. So why we would think that we would get a fair shake when, and I use the word we, and I'm going to tell you why, and i tell you why that's important, particularly as an African-American man, when you do presentations like this, 
to talk about it in that, in that tense because I am part of that. This is not about them. This is about us. And this is about me even today and about you even today. So that's why I want to just make that point. This other clip, it was a clip that was done by, by a number of people. In fact, some of, the good, some of the work was actually shared even here at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai has a great uh, reputation for really tackling these injustice issues. And, and Steve Whitman was one of those great, great pioneers that really did a lot of work and deserves um, what he's done over here to bring these things to fore. Just an amazing man. I'm, privilege that I had a chance to work with him before his passing. But with this, this particular one about not just education, what they looked at was the low birth weight and prematurity among babies born to black women, even well-educated and professional black women, still had low birth weight babies at a much higher rate than their high school educated counterparts. And in the clip, one of the things that Dr. Kamara Jones, the past president of the American Public Health Association, talks about is that she compares racism to like gunning the engine. It's something that you're always aware of, always, it's always present in your mind. She says it's like gunning the engine. And they looked at black pre uh, blood pressures of blacks and whites. And blood pressures among whites would go down at night while blood pressures of blacks stayed up. And it's because of this always, this, this increase, what we call cortisol and other things that created this, this persistent state. And the last movie I was gonna show was, uh, well, second to the last movies I'm gonna show was what's called the Water Diversion Policy. This was a policy that was enacted against the Pima, the so-called Pima, I hate to use the word because it's so wrong, Indians. Uh, that should be a word that should, I mean, it's absolutely wrong to call these people Indians. It is it's wrong, it is racist, it is, it just, it's just the worst thing that I can think of. So we should call them by who they call themselves, whether they're Cheyenne or the Navajo or whatever group they, uh, how they identify themselves. We have to begin to respect what, uh, what the, the natural names are and the natural customs because out of the context of global white supremacy, we've denigrated all those things. We told those people that their customs didn't count, that their things didn't count. I mean, this country supplied smallpox infected blankets to these people. This country slaughtered many of these people and then took their own land and put them on what's called a reservation and now injected a means for them. They're among the poorest people in the United States of America. They have some of the worst health count outcomes. Why? Not because there's anything. We don't need to do any genetic studies. We don't need to do any of that kind of crap. What we need to do is restore these people to a level of respect and create better mo models for them to be able to be self-sufficient. Diabetes. There was no diabetes among the Pima. They went from no diabetes to now the expectation of most of them is that they will get diabetes, they will lose a limb, and they will die. That is the expectation. Why? Because they were fed the same commodities food as the people from the Marshall Islands. So when they were taken off, and so what happened here is the water that used to irrigate their crops where they could grow their indigenous food was diverted to provide water for the white cattlemen and the gold mining interests. And that water would used to flow up through the Gila River to irrigate their crops went away. And as they could not grow their crops, they turned, they were given commodities foods. And this is murder in my mind. This is murder. And if I could show you uh, the, uh, the clip, and I would suggest that many of you go, this has been done time and time and time and time again. It's been done by the uh, Dr. Clark in the 50s, redone again by, the, um, by Kira Davis when she did the movie that was on Oprah's show called A Girl Like Me. And then it was done again by the University of Chicago professors 
and one of our noted journalists that actually looked at this whole situation again. And to me, even though, and I, and, and I, when I was when I was running the health department for the city of Chicago, we did a, a very interesting, I had Carl Bell bring in some people to do a real interesting conversation about what we could do about mental illness, what could be prevented. One of the people he brought in, and I had a long talk with Dr. Vincent Folletti. And I know this whole thing about adverse childhood experiences, but let me tell you about that study. That study was never designed to do that. That was a dietary study. That's how it started. Doctor, and I know this because he told me himself, but he was tasked, he was working for one of the major insurance companies in, um, in San Diego, California, and they were trying to deal with the obesity situation among their uh, the people that were in that, that group. And he started to try and come up with something that he could do to help fight obesity for this group in the Kaiser Permanente plan. And what, what he did was try to begin to understand what some of the drivers for why people ate, in, in a nutshell. And out of that, what he noticed were there were certain things that for this very, and you gotta look at the, look at the study population, about 17,000 people. It was only about, if I remember correctly, less than 11% of them were African American. There were a lot of things that, that we now, and I was guilty of it, that we've transposed on to thinking about how we think about things today. And yes, do things that happen to people in their childhood have an impact on their adulthood? Absolutely. I'm suggesting to you, for the things that I've just talked about for the last few minutes, what's the impact of that on your childhood? Is that not the adverse childhood experience? And is there a transgenerational component to that, particularly since the systems of oppression that created that still exist today? So our children, as we see typified by the violence that we're seeing on the streets, cities of, the streets of Chicago, these things represent the continued disintegration of the family. That's the, that's the in my opinion, that's one of the number one causes, the, the disintegration of the family. Secondly, when we continue to have a construct that has these children of color, and for those of you, there's another movie called Dark Girls, uh, and especially among women, black women, darker colored women are not viewed as pretty as light skinned women. Darker skinned women have, um, today, not yesterday, today, right now, are still being viewed that way. Why? And darker skinned men have a different uh, observation. There were studies done in, Lloyd, at, at, uh, in, in Atlanta looking at hiring practices. A lighter skinned person, even if interviewed far by an African American, is still more likely to get the job than a darker skinned person. Yeah. Where does that construct come from? Where does that self-hatred construct come from? And is it gone? Absolutely not. But this is happening all over the, the world where we find people of darker skin. So I asked the question as I prepare to close, really how far are we come? And how can we think about what we can do to effectuate meaningful change in this tide? Because if we don't begin to think about this and how we deal with this, we won't get through, we won't make any real change. And the, it's a transition, transgenerational issue. And unfortunately, I have to say that many of these stereotypes for black children are reinforced in their own homes in their own homes. And that's how deep this problem is. And to me, though it may not be the, the entire thing, but it's what, as I think about the young man that was 16 years old over here on the west side a little while ago who had an AK-47 and he shot these boys with an AK-47. And then after they were dead, he stood over some more and shot them some more. I mean, what drives somebody to do something? What creates such devaluation of life that I could take someone's life without thinking about it? The answer is not prisons. The answer, I mean, that's part of it, but part of what we have to do is understand this at its causation level. Because until we fix the cause, we'll never fix this. And then 
the thing that disturbed me, these are, this is textbook coming from a Texas, coming from Texas. This is the revisionist history that's already starting. So here is the passage here. The transatlantic the Atlantic slave trade between 1500s and 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. That's revisionist history. That's what children are getting. Now, it was pulled from the electronic version of the textbooks, but it was still in much, many of the books that were printed. So I ask you, do we really think true equity, whether it's heteroracial or homoracial, is really possible? I thank you for your time and your time and your concentration for this. And I don't know if I have time for questions, yes. but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> My only hope is that this has created a, a way for us to contextualize the things that we're going to hear the rest of the day, because. Oftentimes, this particular message is lost. Yes? Question? Hold on. Thank you very much. And thank you for getting all that squared away from me. I appreciate it. Wait a minute. We're going to bring your microphone. Check, check. Who is it? And also, I want to say, Dr. Vessel, that this is also an issue in our churches. Correct. Okay? Because we want to ignore that many times in our churches. And we got to stop it right now. Yes, sir. Okay, there were just two quick things. First, you mentioned the, in, in, the, in the geographical area of the white uh, supremacy group. I smile because you, you mentioned global. The word global just simply meant it was all over. Mm -hmm. But we also see it up close in two factors. We can also see that with uh, Adolf Hitler. But we can also ask the same question. How is it that the person have to work to, in school to get a master's or a doctorate degree and sit at the desk where the boss, who was white, just got their high school diploma? and telling them what to do. And we don't see a problem. And then when you ask, is there a problem, then they look at you like, what is your problem? I would ask that we really ask a question. Because I want to make sure I give everybody time to ask a question. Was another question? Yes, yes ma'am, go right ahead. The question was, does that same theory approve in the question? I can't comment on about Adolf Hitler. I'm only going to comment on what I described. Okay. Adolf Hitler had a totally different agenda. Um, that may have been part of it. But I think that I want to really focus this conversation about what we're dealing with the race. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, your presentation. My question is, you asked the question, is equality or could we be equitable? Is it possible? And my, as a public health professional, I'm kind of thinking not. I feel as a black woman, anytime that you're as a uh, the gentleman said anytime that you're qualified and sometimes overqualified and it still takes weeks for you to get a job compared to your counterpart, you know, it uh, makes it seem unreal. So uh, with that being said, what would you think would be the first steps needed to create a workforce, a public health workforce to help dismantle some of these uh, health disparities and uh, health inequities? I really don't believe disbanding them is possible. I'm just going to say that. I don't believe it. Because if it were possible, it would have been done by now. So what I say is that we then have to live as best we can in the situations that we have. But here's what I would say about that. And we knew this at one time. We need our own institutions. We need to not, we need to stop 
trying to beg and plead our way into these other systems. And we need to think about how we create our own. And we, our own schools, the Howards, the Meharrys, the, the, the Spellmans, and, the, all, and I'm not saying totally separate from one point of view, but I am saying that we need to take our expertise and build what our foreparents did and build our own institutions because they knew that then. This is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on forever. And so what we have to do is like every other group, every other group, whether they were from a religious or ethnic persuasion, I mean, and, and I'm gonna use this and I don't mean it in a pejorative way at all, but look at the Jewish people. They have excelled in education. They've excelled in the financial marketplace. Now, I'm not saying it was all, it was easy, and I'm not, I'm not putting any values on way or the way that was happened, that, that happened, but the one thing we do have is the right and the ability, if we take what we know and begin to use it for ourselves. We need to build our own. We need to do the, we need to have our own schools. That's what, that's why these schools got started in the first place. And the businesses, Yes, Wall, Black Wall Street was bombed and burned, so we rebuild. And this time we protect it. And if anybody comes to do any bombing or building, that'll be the last time they try to bomb or build, bomb anything. We got to get serious about it, and we need to teach our, that's why our young people don't respect us, because we're not doing anything. We need to be out here building. I'm not, I'm not picking up no protest sign, I'm not doing marching, I'm not doing, unless we marching to build our own schools. We have, we have a $3 trillion economy among black people, and here we are wasting our money on foolishness. And we need to stop it, and we need to call it out for what it is. We don't have a lack of money, we have a lack of will. And we're still brainwashed to thinking that we're gonna get righteousness out of a people that have done the wrong thing for over 400 years. How long is it gonna take you to understand that? Now, and I believe, I believe, that if people saw us trying to do something for ourselves and to be able to build our own institutions and to make them as strong as academically and doing the research and doing all the things that we used to do, after all, we gave research to the world. And if we did that, we would get help from other people. Why? Because they would be attracted to the scholarship. They would be attracted to the things that we're trying to do. And they would find a way if we, if we did it, I'm not, I'm not interested in nothing else. I don't want to talk about anything else. I almost didn't want to talk about this this morning. I'm going to be honest with you, because I've been talking about it for 25 years, and, I, and if I live 25 more years, I'd be talking about it again. And I'm sick of it. The time is for black folks and anybody that wants to help us do something for ourselves to start doing it today, right now. Now, that's what we need to do. And stop this going around and begging and hoping that somebody that's never treated a system that has never treated us equitably is now in 2017 going to start to do that. And I'm sorry for that little tirade, but that's, that's, you know, you ask me, that's what you got. And I'm unapologetic about it. One more question. Yeah, one more question. Where is it? Yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Good morning. And I want to thank you for that insightful thing because this is something I addressed for almost 30 years. Now, my question is, and you were bringing up Black Wall Street because that was going to be part of my question. That was, but, but that's part of A of my question. Part B is, we have, what would you suggest? I mean, this is going to encompass quite a bit, but what would you suggest? Because, let's face it, globally, we're not taken seriously for all the reasons that you said. Mm -hmm. So how would we begin the process of, I'm not even going to say civil rights, because why should I fight someone to be civil to me? I shouldn't be fighting, I should be fighting for equal rights, not for no civil rights. I don't need nobody to be civil to me. So where will we start that conversation to build, like you said, our own Wall Street and our own protection of that Wall Street so that doesn't happen again. Yeah. Well, let me just say, well, first of all, what I've suggested is not anything different than everybody else already does. I was coming from um, the western suburbs. I had to go to Berwyn to testify 
for the passage of Tobacco 21. And as I drove down 40, what street? I drove to a Hispanic neighborhood. All the stores, all of the businesses, all of the people I saw were Hispanic. Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna say Mexican, or I understand those di differentiations. The point I'm trying to make, as I continue driving east, as I continue driving east along that street, when I got to the areas that were predominantly black, I didn't see any stores. I didn't see any businesses. I didn't see, and I'm gonna say that that's, that's the issue. Now, we can say, well, we don't have this, we don't have that, we, you know what? Neither did a lot of other people. But what they did have was a sense of identity that let them understand that nobody's gonna take care of them but them. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna, if people aren't gonna hire you, then yes, we need, we should, that shouldn't be a problem if you're qualified, but if not, we should have our own, right now we have fewer law firms, fewer business opportunities, fewer uh, consultant firms, fewer, even our own schools. And even when I say our own schools, they don't, they don't have to be schools that are brick and mortar that are owned necessarily by us, but they could be controlled by us. They could be, you know, and just like other, other places. I mean, you start looking at the ethno history of places like the University of Chicago, Northwestern, different places. And you begin to see a certain ethnic, ethnic, ethnography uh, in those particular institutions. And nobody is any smarter than anybody else. And yes, we've had some setbacks, but there are other people that have had setbacks. They've not had the setback of color because we can't hide that, okay? We can't hide that. But you know what? We gotta stop making excuses and we gotta start working. We need to start with making sure we start educating our children you know, our schools, many of our schools are in disrepair. We are looking at the, the, the disaster of Chicago public school system. Uh, there are a lot of different things. And I think everybody gets in where they fit in. I can't tell you what to do, or you what to do, or you what to do. You have to find out where you get in. And I have to thank uh, Greg Vessel for at least having a meeting like this where we can talk about it. And I've just, and it has not been my intention to insult anyone. It's not been my intention to hurt anybody's feelings, but I, it was my intention to tell the truth and, to, and deal with the history as it is. And whether, and, and you know, we're not, if you look all over Chicago, the, the, the uh, as I, I used to drive the bus for CTA before I went to medical school, and I never realized how, sex, how segregated the city of Chicago, not just racially, but ethnically. Yes. Yes. It's ethnic, and because why? Because they understand. So I drove through Little Lithuania, and I drove through the, and then the difference in every, all his are the same. The Puerto Ricans got one group, and the Hispanics got another, and, but they support each other. And even, you know, everybody needs, and there's nothing wrong with that. We can live together and coexist and share each other from a point of view of respect, because I got mine just like you got yours. And if we don't use our, edu our miseducation, because that's what we receive, a miseducation, because our education has not served us. And so we need to think about how we do that, and how we pull together our churches, our businesses, our, and that's why on my radio show, which by the way is every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on AM 1690 WVON. <laughs> We're looking at the second generation and we're looking at, we have lost more businesses, African-American-owned businesses, since I've been here. We used to have, I've told over 20 black deal, automobile dealerships. Yeah. I can't think of maybe more than two. Now, it doesn't mean you're gonna go to white dealerships or anybody else's dealership, but how do we circulate, and there's studies that talk about how much, how many times the dollar circulates in different communities. So I'm just saying that we should just do like everybody else. Yep. You know, what is it talking about? The son of man has nowhere to what? Lay his head. And the bird has what? He's got a nest. We ain't got sense enough to make a nest. So I thank you. And I hope that you take this in the spirit that it was given. That we then leave this room ready to work. And I thank you, Reverend Vessel, for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to go out here and get my education in nutrition so I can come back and do <laughs> what I think. Stuff. More stuff, yeah. Thank you very much. God bless you all.
That was a lot, right? Oh my God. He kicked it off. He took us where we need to be. It's about the truth, and only the truth will set you free. And we've been miseducated, and we've missed some education. And we gotta get it. We gotta change the face of what is happening in our community. We have to do it. That's why ABLE exists. That's why TRIM exists. Because we have to get it done. And it is true what he said. If you get busy doing something that is purposeful, what will happen, help will come. I'm sitting at the table with Michelle Sherman. Help will come. People will see that you're doing something. The Staines Foundation saw that we were doing something at ABLE, and they came alongside and began to give support to the work that we're doing. You do have to get busy doing something. We must own again. And one of the things that really devastated me uh, coming up is that we were told to go to school to get a job to work for somebody else, whereas our counterparts were told, you go to school so you can own the company that'll hire the people that'll work for you. So it's all in how you're educated. So you think you're doing great because you went to school to get a job. Yeah. You go to school now, you get a bill. <laughs> if you don't have a vision for ownership. So as a pastor, I tell my folk, even if you work for somebody else, you gotta have a work of your own hands. God is giving you something that'll make money for you legally. You must have another job besides the job that you may be on because they can give you a pink slip any day. That's right. You must have a work of your own hands. So we have to get that out again. We gotta re-educate our community and we're the ones that are gonna stop the killings. These are our children yes. Yes. that are killing somebody else's children and we have to do something about it. We have to do it because we can do it, and we're going to do it. And I'm part of that leadership that's going to make it happen. And so I'm just really thankful that you all are here. Let's deal with the truth. Let's roll up our sleeves and get ready to work, to own, to build, and to solidify what has been torn apart in the lives of wonderful people that God made. Everybody deserves a right to live and to thrive. And we want to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Love you. Good, safe travels. Next, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Audrey Stillerman, and she's going to take us into that realm regarding the ACES. Uh, Dr. Stillerman, where are you, darling? There she comes. Give her a big hand. I met her at a conference. She was phenomenal, but she has to be at the college conference. Oh, my goodness. You can read all about her. I don't want to say it any time, because this is all good stuff. As, as soon as everybody... Um gets these things will we'll start. Um, I, uh, I actually, I, um, I've been following Dr. Mason since I was a, a medical student. This is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting him and, and hearing him, and I am wowed as I expected to be. Um, he made me think about a lot of things that will dovetail um, with what I'm about to talk to you about. But I wanted to also um, give you a couple of quotes from um, my late and dear uh, boss, uh, Dr. Cynthia Barnes Boyd, she used to say, don't ask permission now, just ask forgiveness later. Do what you need to do. Um, and another colleague uh, also has a, a, another version of this. She says, proceed until apprehended. So go out and do it. Um, okay, so I think, we, I think we're pretty good. Um, we're gonna start with, um, the hot pink, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire. I, I want to invite you to complete it with me. I'm actually going to read out the questions for you. If for some reason you feel uncomfortable with these questions, you do not have to do it. This is not required. We want to invite you to do it. Um, it is helpful um, for I am able to kind of get a sense of um, who's in the room. Don't put your name on it. It's anonymous. And we'll read along together. Um, and you just put a one if any of these questions apply to you. So the first question is, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? If this is true, put a one in the box on the, on the right. If it's not, put a zero. Question two is, did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? If this is true, put a one 
in the line, and if not, a zero. Three, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touched their body in a sexual way or try to or, try to, or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you? If, if that happened, a one, and if not, a zero. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? This is true, place a one on the line, if not a zero. Did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? One if true and zero if not. Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Yes is one, no is zero. Was your mother or your stepmother often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few mittens, or threatened with gun or knife? One for yes, zero for no. Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker, or alcoholic, or who used street drugs? One for yes, zero for no. Was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? One for yes, zero for no. And then finally, did a household member go to prison? One for yes, zero for no. And so if you could, just add up all the ones on the right side and just write the total down on the bottom. And I'll give you a minute to do that. And then we're going to move over to the, to the yellow. OK. So we're going to do the yellow sheet, which is the flip side of adversity. So adversity means difficult things, challenges. And resilience is flexibility, is our ability to bounce back. And so there are things that protect us. And that's what these questions are about. So the first is, I believe that my mother loved me when I was little. And the choices are definitely true. Probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. Circle the one that, is, that best describes you. Two is, I believe that my father loved me when I was little. Same choices. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. When I was little, other people helped my mother and father take care of me, and they seemed to love me. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. Number four is, I've heard that when I was an infant, someone in my family enjoyed playing with me, and I enjoyed it too. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. Number five, when I was a child, there were relatives in my family who made me feel better if I was sad or worried. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. When I was a child, neighbors or my friend's parents seemed to like me. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. Seven is when I was a child, teachers, coaches, youth leaders, or ministers were there to help me. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. Number eight. Someone in my family cared about how I was doing in school. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. Number nine, my family, neighbors, and friends talked often about making our lives better. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. Number 10, we had rules in our house and were expected to keep them. Definitely true, probably true, not true, probably not true, or definitely not true. Number 11, when I felt really bad, I could almost always find someone I trusted to talk to. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. Number 12, as a youth, people noticed that I was capable and could get things done. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. 
Number 13, I was independent and a go-getter. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, or definitely not true. And finally, I believed that life is what you make it. Definitely true, probably true, not sure, probably not true, and definitely not true. When you finish, if you could add up, you get one point for every, every definitely true or probably true. So you'll add up those ones. Those are on the left side of your paper. And the score on the top line is the total of those ones about when you were a child. And then there's a second question that asks how many are still true for you. So if, if that's different, if there are more things that are true now as you're an adult, then you, uh, you know, add up those scores. And I'll give you guys a minute to complete that. Okay, so thank you everyone for um, participating in doing this. I, I wanna get a sense, we're gonna do the, the use the thumbs, because um, I'm interested in how it felt to you to answer these questions. This is good, this is not one way or the other, this is hard. How many thumbs up do we have? How many thumbs in the middle? How many thumbs down? Yeah, it, this can be, this, can, this stuff can be challenging, can unearth things. If it did for you, um, please come and connect with uh, one of the I am able people for a hug or whatever else you might need. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get into our presentation now. Um, and we're gonna talk about adverse childhood experiences resilience and hope and we, oh yes put them in the center of the table because we're going to go ahead and collect them and if you want a copy of this just for your own um, the I am able people have an electronic copy we can always share that if you want it okay so here's what we're going to talk about this morning we're going to talk about adversity health and well-being across the lifespan we're gonna talk about the biology of personal, social, and historical experience. So we're gonna have a science lesson. If you believe, you're gonna actually know more than most doctors and nurses do. Um, and we're gonna talk about how we build resilience, healing, and hope. So you might be wondering where the heck did these questions come from? And so that's how we're gonna begin. And Dr. Mason talked a little bit about this, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth about it. But in the late 80s and in the 90s, there was a doctor in California named Dr. Vince Felitti, and he was working as the director of an obesity clinic for people who were very, very, very overweight. And he started to notice that many of the patients that he was caring for, and particularly the patients who were losing weight and then dropping out, had a history of sexual abuse. And so he started to interview those patients. And he had about 300 patients and found that there was a very, very high incidence of sexual abuse among his patients in that weight loss clinic. And he presented the information to a group of psychiatrists who laughed at him and said, you're being manipulated by those patients. That's just bad behavior. It's not anything that happened to them. But there was somebody from the Center for Disease Control in the audience who came up to him afterwards and said, you know, what you found is really interesting. Let's see if we can do a bigger study and see what we can demonstrate. So he teamed up with another doctor from the Center for Disease Control named Dr. Robert Anda. And Dr. Anda actually had been studying the connection between loneliness and heart disease. And so they both were, had a sense that there was something about our emotional life that affected our physical health and well-being. And they designed a questionnaire of 10 items about abuse, neglect, and household problems. And that's what you see right here in the pink. And they, t they connected it to an extensive health history that they were giving already that asked questions about physical health, about mental health, and also about social health. So like about things that happen in the workplace or in relationships. And that was called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. They surveyed 17,000 people who were mostly white and Hispanic. This um, study took place in San Diego. All of the patients were part of the Kaiser Health Plan, so they all had health insurance. They were working. They were mostly middle class people. And um, they, uh, 
they were all had some college education. And what they did was they assigned a point for each one of these questions. So the total of 10 was the highest number of these adversities that you could get, and the lowest was zero. They were blown away by what they found. What they found was this, that if a person answered yes to one of the questions, they were very, very likely to have had more than one of these experiences, that these things seemed to come together in clumps. They also found that of their 17,000 people, two-thirds of them had at least one of these experiences. About a quarter had more than three, and about 5% had more than six. And the magical number of six is magical because it's very alarming. People who had experiences of more than six had much higher risk of dying 20 years earlier than the expected lifespan. They found out that accumulation matters. So the more of these experiences that you had, the more likely you were to have physical, mental, or social health problems. So what they looked at this study as is that these questions, these experiences, were a very good proxy, a good marker for toxic stress that had happened in adulthood and later found that even more than many of the other things that we think of as risk factors for disease, like smoking and drinking and eating too much, these experiences were some of the most powerful known determinants of health. So the things that were really interesting are that these experiences actually had an impact on things that we think of as just of the body. So like hypertension and diabetes and cancer and autoimmune disease were all related to adverse childhood experiences. The more of these experiences you had, the more likely you were to have these problems. They were also related to things that we think of as, as risky behaviors. So smoking, using drugs, sexual promiscuity, um, any kind of addiction. And even when those things were present, smoking, drinking, et cetera, there still was a piece of the relationship with the diseases that was strictly related to the adverse experiences in childhood. And finally, they found a relationship between social health, so graduation rates, worker absenteeism, worker performance, um, teen pregnancy, et cetera. I wanted to highlight this because we're talking a little bit about education today, but adverse childhood experiences are highly correlated with academic problems. So with academic failure, with problems with school attendance, and with school behavior concerns. In fact, they are the most powerful indicator of all these things. And in terms of academic success, they're the second highest predictor of academic failure right after being in special education. And what I'll actually tell you is that many kids in special education have high scores on the adverse childhood experiences study. So we need to do a little better job of teasing that out. So this study was done with white people in California. And you might think, like, oh, that's interesting. But like, you know, what does that have to do with us in this room? We're not from California, and many of us are not white either. Um, but this study was duplicated in other states across the country, in 32 of them, in fact, and with diverse populations. And it's been replicated around the world in 31 countries. And the results are very, very similar. Um, higher in some populations than others. For example, higher in homeless populations, higher in incarcerated populations. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit closer to home. We've actually, we have information about childhood adversity in Illinois, both for adults and for children. And for adults, from a 2013 study, about 60% of Illinois adults have at least one adverse childhood experiences. And about 40% of kids from birth to age 17 have had at least one adverse childhood experience. I'm going to take it even closer to us. There's a study called the Chicago Longitudinal Study that um, recruited residents from um, residents of color from the south side of Chicago and has been studying them for about 30 years. The 
reason that um, the study was done was to actually look at whether a preschool intervention was helpful, but a lot of other data was collected as well, and data about adverse childhood experiences were collected. And in fact, the same results were here in Chicago. About two-thirds of the participants of the African American and Latino participants had an ACE score of at least one, and what they found is that those participants whose score was four or more were more likely to drop out of school, more likely to get arrested, more likely to have mental health problems, and less likely to hold skilled jobs. So these experiences have a real effect on our life, all the way across the lifespan. Um, we're going to connect a little bit back with Dr. Mason's um, talk. So. These household experiences are very important, but they're not the only experiences that have an impact on us. And certainly the things that happen in our communities have an, an impact on us as well. So things like poverty or discrimination or violence, poor housing, lack of social connection, all of these things also have an impact on how well, how healthy and what our well-being is going to be across the lifespan. And it's not on this. Um, on this graphic, um, I, my mission, I'm hoping I can make myself do this, I want to reach out to the people who um, created this because there's something missing in the soil. And the something missing in the soil is our historical experiences. So things like slavery, Holocaust, mass incarceration, cultural genocide, all those things contribute to the whole picture. So, the question becomes, how the heck do things that happen out here affect our bodies and our minds? And so we're going to talk a little bit about what those pathways are. This is the science lesson. Um, around the same time as the Adverse Childhood Experiences study was going on, there was an explosion in research about the brain. In fact, the 90s, the mid-90s to the mid-2000s were called the decade of the brain. And so we're just going to do a little elementary stuff to get us oriented. But this is a, a very simplified version of our brain. And our brain has three parts. We have a brain stem, which controls our kind of automatic functions. So our heart rate, our blood pressure, our breathing, our temperature, et cetera. It also sends signal, it collects signals from the body and sends signals back from the body that help us survive. So this is the place that makes you go eek and run away if you think you see a snake. Then we have the middle of the brain, which is the emotional brain. And this is the brain that helps us feel, sense emotions, and also um, consolidate our memories. And then the top portion of the brain is called the cerebral cortex, and that's the part of our brain that thinks. It's kind of the director, the air traffic control of our brain. Our brains develop from the bottom up. There are critical periods of development, and what that means is that there are times when things must happen in order for us to develop certain things. Like, for example, there's a critical period for developing vision. If we're kept in the dark during this critical period, we'll be blind. We won't see. There are also sensitive periods for development. And those periods, in particular, are 0 to 3, and then in the teen years, too, because there's very rapid brain growth and change. So those are very exciting times, and they're particularly vulnerable times, too, if things happen to us during those sensitive periods. So. How does our brain develop? Well, our brain develops in relationship with our caregivers in that context. That's what sets us on one pathway or another. And so it's very, very important all through our lifetime, but especially in the early years, that our parents and everybody, all the other adults who are caring for us have everything they need and are supported so that they can love us and keep us safe and secure, because that relationship is the model on which we build all the other relationships for the rest of our lives. What I want to say here is this is important, 
but it is not a death sentence if this didn't happen for you. Relationships throughout our life can help heal us if we've had challenges in the early years, but anytime we can support people in really caring for their children, let's do it, because it's a really, really critical piece of the development puzzle. And these secure attachments actually help protect us when we have challenges along the way. So if we've had that strong relationship in the beginning, we're much easier to bounce back from, from difficulties. I want to talk about stress for a minute, and we're just going to, again, for simplicity, we're going to divide this up into three kinds of stress. The first is positive stress, and that's the kind of stress that we experience like when we're giving a talk or if we have a test. Um, we get kind of anxious, our blood pressure goes up a little bit, our pulse rate, our respirations. We do it successfully, and then we feel better, and our bodies kind of settle back down into their regular rhythm. Then we have tolerable stress, and that's the kind of stress that we might experience if we have to move or if we lose somebody who's close to us. And usually we're a little off for longer, but if we have caring people, they help buffer our symptoms and help us to settle back down to our kind of baseline physiology. But if we have experiences that are prolonged, severe, happen during critical periods, these kinds of stressors can be toxic. So that is ex exposure to abuse, neglect, um, parents who are unpredictable, and when we don't have other people in our lives who can help to protect us and buffer us, that kind of stress is the stress that gets under our skin. Okay, don't look at all the words. We're just gonna look at three things. So you, this is kind of an imagining of how stress has an impact on our body. So something stressful happens. We notice it in our brain. Our brain sends signals through the rest of our nervous system out to the body to do the things that we need to do to survive. So, you know, our, our baby's underneath the car, it gives us Herculean strength so we can lift the car up and rescue our baby. If this goes on for a long time, it actually has an impact on the way that our bodies work and our brain too, because of course there's feedback between the brain and body all the time. So we want this to happen because we need it to happen in an emergency, but we don't want it to be going on all the time or again and again and again without reprieve. Because when it goes on again and again and again without reprieve, we can get stuck either in a very aroused state, a very turned on state, or we can get shut down in a very turned off state. And when we get stuck in those places, it's much harder for us to go about our business. It's hard to concentrate, it's hard to do our work, it's hard to have relationships because we're either too agitated or too withdrawn. And it kind of looks like this. So stuck on on, you know that big green guy, and shut down, can't relate and we need flexibility. So you might also be saying, well, what about genetics? And again, I really appreciate what Dr. Mason said. Genetics really is only a teeny little piece of the whole story. And the part that I want to talk to you about is how our genes communicate with the environment. There's a dialogue, there's a dynamic relationship between our genes and the environment because there are these markers on our genes, these little pieces called epigenes, and they actually respond to changes because the whole point of this is that nature really wants us to be able to adapt to our whatever's happening. Um, and often whatever's happening now, nature thinks, well, we want to prepare the next generation for that too. And I want to just give you a little story about that. So there was a famine in the Netherlands, I think like in the 1940s. And there wasn't enough to eat for everybody, including the pregnant women. And women who were pregnant during that time period delivered babies who grew up when there wasn't a famine. 
And more of those babies actually became obese and developed diabetes because their bodies had been prepared for famine in utero. So that's an example about how the outside actually can influence uh, both our genes and the way our bodies function. So the pyramid on the, on the left is the original ACES pyramid. And that, I'm just going to take you through it. Um, we have experiences in childhood that are difficult and painful and hurtful to us. They may lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Uh, we, we might adopt health risk behaviors like smoking or drinking. And all of those things combined may lead us to disease, disability, and social problems, and potentially to early death. Now, the things that we see on this pyramid are the top two layers, the disease, disability, and early death. But the things underneath the surface, those are the root causes. And the nice thing about the pyramid on the right is that it acknowledges all of those things from the original ACE study, but also adds the other things that we can't see, the things in the soil. So the social conditions and local context and the generational embodiment of historical trauma. So all of those things contribute to our health or well-being in the present time. What this kind of pyramid thing is, is something called a mental model. What that is, is the way that we can um, imagine and talk about very complicated things. Because of course, this isn't really what this is. What we live and do is, is, re is the reality of you know, disease, disability, early death, cognitive problems, et cetera. But this is a representation of that. And back to Dr. Mason again, our biggest work is actually to change our assumptions and beliefs, our mental models, because that's what underlies all the things that we do and see. So in this particular situation, what we want to think is, or what we want to change our beliefs and assumptions to, is that the experiences of the people who came before us the communities and the conditions in which we live and what's going on in our households all have an impact on our health and well-being. And in fact, are really the drivers of those things, whether they're positive or negative. And so that's this representation. So genetics, adverse childhood experiences or historical experiences, and critical and sensitive developmental periods have an impact on the way that our brain develops, every aspect of it, how big it is, how it functions, what electrical signals it sends. And those messages from our brains get hardwired into our bodies and create the conditions that we see, both in ourselves, in our families, and also in our communities and across generations. So that's a lot of heavy stuff that I just talked about. But there is a good side to this. Remember, we had the resilience questionnaire. Well, we're going to talk about the good news right now. So two words I want to define. Neuroplasticity, which is the ability of our brain to change and to adapt to our situation. And that neuroplasticity, that ability to change, is with us until the day we die. It's easier for our brain to change when we're younger but it's possible for it to change throughout the lifespan. So to me, that's really good news. Um, also, we are resilient, which means as human beings, we have the capacity to bounce back. Now, we're not born with that capacity, but we can develop that capacity. In fact, that's what we're thinking about and talking about today is how do we create the conditions for all of us to be as bouncy as possible? And we want to try to think about how we create those conditions at every level of our culture. So from the individual, to the family, to the community, to the government, to those structures, to those beliefs and assumptions that make up how we do things. And we want to think about it across time. And the cool thing is that 
when we do a little something in each sphere, whatever makes sense for that sphere, all of those interventions layer on each other and create big changes. And we've seen this in communities across the country. So there's everything that says can happen in this community too. And it's all about people working together and identifying what's important to them. So back to neurodevelopment and attachment. This is the beginning. This is where we really need to start. So for our unborn babies, we need to really care for those moms and dads so that they can be the best parents they can be, so they can help to optimize the development of their children. And we also need to take care of those moms and dads because they're important too. Those are the people who are gonna work for us, they're gonna be our neighbors, they're gonna be our friends. So this is how we do it. We make sure that everybody has their basic needs met. You can't get anything done if you don't have enough to eat or a place to live or if you don't feel safe. You're afraid for your life every day. So this is what we have to do as a whole society, is to take care of the basic needs so we can get to the exciting stuff about creativity and expression and meaning and purpose. And this actually, this triangle is old. It's from 1943 from a psychologist named Abraham Maslow. So nothing new, but very relevant. So how do we do that? Well, there's actually a lot of research and these strategies are both preventive and uh, are for treatment. And so I'm gonna tell you what some of those are. So the first thing that I don't have a picture of on here is giving space for people to share their experiences in uh, a place that is non-judgmental and accepting of them. When Dr. Felita and Anda did the original ACE study, they actually did a follow-up study in which they had patients take the ACE questionnaire and come and see their doctor, and their doctor asked them one question, and the one question was, I noticed that you said yes to the question that your parent had a mental illness. Tell me how you think that that has affected you in your adult life. That's all they did, and then they listened to the story. They did it for each question. And what Dr. Felita and Anda did is they, they measured afterwards the number of doctor visits, the number of ER visits, the number of hospitalizations, the number of filled prescriptions in that population that had the opportunity to talk uh, and be listened to by their physicians. Everything decreased dramatically. Fewer ER visits, fewer hospitalizations, fewer doctor visits, less prescription drug use in the year following this conversation. Unfortunately, there were not more interventions, so the effect sort of disappeared over time, but we know that this is very powerful. Other things that are very helpful are things that are rhythmic. And so those are things like walking and swimming and marching or drumming and music and dancing. All those things help our brain stem, which is the rhythmic center of our brain, to get settled down. Art is also really fantastic, so any kind of artistic expression, theater, visual art, um, writing, all of those things help us to express ourselves in ways that don't necessarily involve words or aren't about a conversation. Um, regulation, so developing body awareness and awareness of the present moment, and that's what that little boy is doing, he's meditating. And that helps us to settle down. It helps us to prevent the symptoms that go with life challenges, but also to treat those that are suffering because of their experiences. Um, relationship, that's what I talked about a little bit with the doctor visit, but that's the most important thing that we can all do for each other. We can be there, we can listen, and we can care as much as we can without judgment and with acceptance. That's what helps people heal. There's some trauma-specific therapies too, which I just wanna to touch on. Um, they're not widely available, available, but they are well-researched and 
they're going to be more widely available because I think that people are really hopping on the bandwagon because they're so successful. One is called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. What that is is the patient tells a story while being stimulated either with a light or with fingers moving or with vibration, and that seems to reset the brain. Um, there's something called neurofeedback, which is a, a kind of biofeedback with a computer in which the brain waves are measured and the patient does activities to have an impact on the brain waves. And that really helps traumatic experience as well. Two things that help that we can do, we don't need fancy equipment for either of them. One is something called ecotherapy, which means going outside. That's something that we can all do, um, hopefully, at least in our yards. Um, and the other thing is um, coloring. Coloring is another self-regulating activity. The act of doing this is very calming for us. So these are things that don't cost a lot of money and that we can do anywhere, really. Uh -oh. There we go. OK, so I, did, I didn't want to talk a lot about money, but I want to talk a little bit about this. For every dollar that we invest in healing and prevention, we get a $6 return, and that's in every sector, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's social services. So this money is well spent. So I just want to leave you with this, and that is that we have to take action for ourselves to whatever degree that we can, because experiences that we have determine how well or ill we're going to be, that these ex because these experiences actually influence our, our biology, and that activities that include rhythm and regulation and ways that we can relate to each other are the solutions. And so what I want to say in closing is please love yourself love each other, and on that love, we can actually build something that's really different. Thank you very much. Okay, you have time for three to five questions uh, with Dr. Tillerman. Yes. What's the uh, <coughs> is the page that you read uh, on rhythm, self-regulation, and relationships? I want to each He's coming with a mic. Oh. Okay, on rhythm, self-regulation, and relationships, uh, do you, at what age do you, you start? So you can you born yes, born? yes. So think, so you can rock your baby. That's rhythm, right? You can pat your baby. Relationship, you look at your baby with eye contact. You talk to your baby. You respond when the baby makes funny faces, you make them back. So yes, from the very beginning and even in utero. Other questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Thank you. So one of the questions um, some of the committee uh, members I came up with at Trim is that we noticed uh, with the AIDS, it doesn't necessarily, it, it kind of talks more so about trauma experience around the household and those things. So what are the things that you think is best to assess or could we add to the ACEs to assess about the trauma, say, that they experience? Uh, by living in uh, violent neighborhoods or the day-to-day -day trauma? I'm so glad that you asked that, and I'm sorry that I didn't mention it before. There's actually a very brilliant and wonderful pediatrician from Philadelphia. His name, he's an um, African-American guy from Philadelphia named Roy Wade. And he um, has expanded the ACE questionnaire to include some of those questions. In fact, Dr. Felitti and Anda wanted to include other questions in this questionnaire too, and there was a tussle at the CDC, and they, this is what they were allowed to do. But Dr. Wade has gone forward, and he includes things like, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? 
Um, has any, have you ever been bullied? Were you in foster care? Do you have enough to eat, et cetera? So, so those things, those community level experiences that we know have the same impact on our brain and physiology as the household experiences. And there are also, I didn't show these slides. There's a couple, I'll describe them to you, a couple of graphs that are very interesting. There's something called the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And they did a survey across the country um, around the adverse childhood experiences, but also things like we talked about community violence, um, uh, uh, chronic illness, um, and some other things like you know forced displacement, war, et cetera. In the sample that they did, which was a, a sample across the country, so still majority white because the country is majority white, what they came up with is that the, adverse, the original adverse childhood experiences were the most common traumas. But someone else named um, David Finkelhor actually looked at these results in communities of color. And in fact, the household adverse childhood experiences are not the most common experiences in those communities. It's the community level experiences that are the most common. So it's very, it's, it's very important. I mean, I think the thing that I think about about this is that all of us have potential experiences in our households, but there are many of us because of our gender or because of our race that have experiences out in the world that um, can hurt us. Yes? Thank you. I wanted to know that you presented the question at the beginning, but I didn't hear the answer. And the question was pertaining to the doctors uh, findings of those who were sexually abused and, um, and abused in other ways because of their situations. Was it a yes or was it a no? Because they first said yes, but then you went into the two doctors that went on in. Right. Yes. So let me tell. Yes. Term? Let me tell you about that. So in that in that sample of patients who were struggling with overweight and obesity, the answer is yes, that that sexual abuse and other experiences of adversity is actually directly linked to the obesity. So I want to, I, I showed a slide in the center, that thing about um, stress and the brain and the signals out to the body. Well, so so obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure, those are all the outcomes of those disrupted brain signals. So we have the experience of sexual abuse or physical abuse or neglect or poverty or whatever it is, that changes the way that our, our brain communicates with the rest of our body through chemically and electrically. And those changes actually are the things that get us out of balance and produce disease. Does, did that answer the question? Okay. Other questions? So I'm, I'm actually, I'm just gonna say one more thing related to that. So you could say that diabetes and hypertension and obesity and lupus, and we could go on, are, are actually diseases of the brain, which is kind of radical. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, let me see if I can get it off of here. And the other thing I want to tell you, I'm going to send a PDF of my slides to Reverend Vessel, so, okay. So this is from Memphis Data Partners, and it's a, a, an article by Jose Diaz. It's called Prospective Return on Investment of the North Side Achievement Zone. So probably something, a project in Tennessee that did a projection. Sure. One well, last question. Right here. I'm sorry, I'm looking uh, at the quiet time in schools. Uh, yes. Some are really interesting because of your description of 
Yes, uh, are you talking about the Quiet Time program from the David Lynch Foundation or just? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, D okay, I, do you want me to, I can talk about that for a minute. Um, so, so any kind of meditation will do, and one kind of meditation that is available to some people in the city of Chicago right now and is actually being studied extensively is something called transcendental meditation. What that is in essence is you learn a word, doesn't have any meaning, but it has certain vibrational qualities, and you learn to repeat it to yourself over and over and over again, quietly, silently, in your mind. This has been practiced for thousands of years, but um, the David Lynch Foundation has a program called Quiet Time that is being implemented in a number of Chicago public schools and being studied by the University of Chicago Crime Lab in terms of educational outcomes, um, infractions by the kids, violence in the schools, and incredible, incredible positive results. And people are seeing this with other kinds of um, meditative practices across the country, whether it's yoga or whether it's mindfulness meditation. It, frankly, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as you do it and as long as it is something that um, helps you be quiet and also helps you have internal awareness. Can you please welcome, for the first time at the trauma conference, the example setters. Are you ready? Always ready, sir. Are you ready? Always ready, sir. Catch us example setters, people every day of the week. Catch us example setters, people every day of the week. Screaming like Living white right and truth is all that we speak. speak. Breathing life, living white right and truth is all that we speak. speak. We just really don't want to be another shorty victim to these streets. Cause they didn't got ugly. Example says not having that. Cause they didn't got ugly. Example says not having that. Violence, you should go away and never come back. This violence get ugly. And we not having that. Violence, you should go away and never come back. Never come what? Back. Never come what? Back. Never come what? Back. Example set is like huh. black and white like huh. on the stage like huh. breathing life like huh. in this sound 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 like huh. stand down. Are you ready? Always ready, sir. Ready for what? Success. Ready for what? Success. By being your very what? Yes. By being your very what? Yes. At all what? Yes. At all what? Yes. Be the what? Yes. Be the what? Yes. Because we are what? Yes. Because we are what? Yes. Hands down to your what? Yes. Hands down to your what? Yes. Because you stand with what? Yes. Because you stand with what? Yes. And you're proud to be who you want. Uh. Proud to be who you want. Uh. Uh. Close your eyes. You have an opportunity meaning to what? Chance. I said you have an opportunity meaning to what? Chance. To save a what? Life. To save a what? Life. Begin it with your what? Self. Begin it with your what? Self. The power of your tongue carry life for what? Death. I said the power of your tongue carry life for what? Death. What do you want? Life. What do you want? Life. life. When do you want it? Now. now. We don't perform, we breathe what? Life. I said we don't perform, we breathe what? Life. All day, every, every day. day. All day, every, every day. day. Open your eyes. Breathe. There's so much stuff in the media that's confusing, losing our what? You. Youth. Confusing, losing our what? You. Youth. And they have no one to stand in front of them and be the what? True. Be the what? True. So we came to feel that. Yeah. No, I say we came to feel that what? Yeah. And we about to what? Snap. Snap. We about to what? Snap. Snap. We don't tell no lie. We don't tell no lie. We don't tell no lie. 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 You get chills when you hear us in the middle of July. Lie. lie. We come with truth. We don't tell no lie. Lie. You get chills when you hear us in the middle of July. Lie. lie. We come with truth, we don't tell no lie, lie. Most of us grew up in single parent homes. No father figure, no father figure. No daddy at home, mama all alone to make it on own. No daddy at home, mama all alone to make it on her own. So the block became my daddy and we did what we what? So did what we what? So that's why y'all gon' get it. Get it in the what? Bro. Get it in the what? Bro. Aunt sister uncut, straight and direct. Aunt sister uncut, straight and direct. And we apologize for anyone who feel disrespect. What? Feel disrespect. What? Feel disrespect. What? But the bottom line is what? what? So the blood became our daddy. daddy. 
And you tell me, did it raise us? Well, most of us ended up dead. And the rest in jail, in jail, in jail. They building new jails. They building new jails. We're brand new cells. We're brand new cells. Why? Because the system designed for us to fail. Yeah. I know that went over y'all heads. But rest assured, they have you, you, and you a bit. We don't tell no lie, lie. At the age of eight. No, I said at the age of eight. My mother says depending on me to put food on there. Play. No, I said food on there. Play. I was forced to be in it. Seven. Forced to be in it. Seven. Seven. At a young age. Instead of learning how to stop, stop drop, and roll. roll. No, I said stop, stop drop, and roll. roll. I was learning how to cop, pop, and reload. No, I said cop, pop, and reload. Pop. pop. We don't tell no. La, la. Baby seven. Baby. No, I said baby seven. Baby. And movies, men get paid to act like. Act like. Act like. Say it again. I won't repeat it twice. Why? Because I don't think it's cute or nice. We don't tell no. La, la. See, I still got to respect my mother. Even though my friends know. She's on drugs. On oh, drugs? Y'all said I still got to respect my mother, even though y'all know she's on drugs. Wait a minute, brother. That don't rhyme. <laughs> he wanted that to rhyme. Maybe next time. Or you try to make it rhyme. The next time you got to pull your mama out of a crack line. Woo! Out of a crack line? We don't tell no. Lie. We don't tell no. Lie. We don't tell no. Lie. Lie. How do y'all expect him to be in class standards on two? Beat. When just last night, he had nothing, nothing to, to eat. eat. Nothing to eat. He should be on your foot. Nuts. No, I say he should be on your foot. Nuts. Nuts. When his belly to his back, back. he can't stay on track. track. How do y'all expect him to act? I can't add or subtract. You can't add or subtract. I should have been here, back. but they passed me. Oh. Cause they said I was getting too wrong. Now they said I was getting too wrong. Now they said I was getting too wrong. He still can't read or write on his own. Oh. No, I said he still can't read or write on his um, own, but they still passed him. Um, they said he was getting too wrong. Um, they said he was getting too wrong. Um, they said he was getting too wrong. Um, we don't tell no lie. We don't tell no lie. We don't tell no lie. lie. They turned school into a business. All about the dollars, dollars, all about the dollars, dollars. They put a price tag on all our church's heads. Head. So they try to move us. Head. They being counted like cattle on a farm. Move. And every farmer wants them on his farm. Mom. We don't tell no lie. 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 Sleepless nights, she talks and she turn. I'm praying that the door now won't turn. See, but it wasn't the boogeyman she was afraid uh, of. See, she didn't want to be hated, but she didn't want that type of love. Stop. Stop. Little girls shouldn't be afraid to sleep at night. No, I said little girls shouldn't be afraid to sleep at night, night because their daddies aren't thinking right. Thinking right. right. We don't tell no lot, lot. See, mama had a man, man. but she called him her boyfriend. boyfriend. No, I said mama had a man. man. And she called him her boyfriend. And he was looking at her boy as a friend. Her boy as a friend. And that was mama's boy. He, he was mama's boy. boy. And I had to bring that to an end. See, I know they say killing is a sin. sin. But I would not let him touch, touch me again. Touch, touch me again. again. Touch, touch you again. again. Mama, we hate to see you cry for this poor excuse of a man. man. So I said this poor excuse of a man. man. But he was old enough to know how to control his hands. Control his hands. Control his hands. We don't tell no lie, lie. You see it on TV. TV. You see it on TV. TV. We live it in 3D. We live it in 3D. No off or off. Rewind, rewind door pause. No off or off. Rewind, rewind door pause. pause. See, they said we're lost cause. But I failed to ask, so what they didn't want you to see. See, 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 see. And it's only your face. You, 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 you. you, you. And me, 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 me. And the answer is the elders and the youth are still not connected. connected. And that's why we all are being disrespected, disrespected, disrespected. No, I don't think y'all heard me. I said the elders and the youth are still not connected. And that's why we all are being disrespected, disrespected, disrespected. Until the elders and the youth connect, there will be no respect, respect, respect. respect. We don't tell no lie, lie. See, no matter how you tell the lies not to what? No, I said no matter how you tell the lies not to what? And we're the what? And we're the what? That God. That God can make something great out of nothing, out of nothing, out of nothing. We don't tell no lie, lie. 
Immobile debt. Immobile debt. Who? What is your birthright? Intelligence. What is your birthright? Intelligence. Where's the truth? Right here. Where's the truth? Right here. And the truth can't be held what? Back. The truth can't be held what? Back. Because we're moving forward to what? Ahead. Forward to what? Ahead. To our what? Success. Our what? Success. On this what? Earth. On this what? Earth. Example set. We're on baby muscle together, sir. Example set. We're on baby muscle together, sir. Out of respect. Respect now, sir. Out of respect. Respect now, sir. Purpose of tension. B.O.A. Purpose of tension. B.O.A. Ready and with rock. Ready and with rock. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Are you ready? Yes, sir. How you feel? Good, good sir. How you feel? Good, good, sir. How good? Real good. How good? Real good. They feel good because they don't have an understanding, but they have a what? Overstanding. I say we feel good because we have an understanding. We have a what? Overstanding. Of who we what? Uh, who we what? Uh, on this what? Earth. On this what? Earth. We're example what? Set Example what? Set Setting proud, positive, powerful, peaceful, productive examples at all what? Tax. At all what? Tax. We are king and queen what? Thinkers. King and queen what? Thinkers. What is a queen thinker? A queen thinker is a girl who thinks like queen, who knows her mind, rules her action. A queen thinker knows her action, reflects to her I am a queen thinker. I am a staff sister. Go ahead, go ahead. What is our model? What we live by. What is our model? What we live by. It is not in our nature to respond to what? Ignorance. It is not in our nature to respond to what? Ignorance. Ignorance is a lack of what? Knowledge. Ignorance is a lack of what? Knowledge. So when you know better, you do what? Better. When you know better, you do what? Better. better. Knowledge is? Mental intelligence. Knowledge is? Mental intelligence. When should you apply it? At all times. When should you apply it? At all times. It is not in our nature to respond to what? Ignorance. Because we are what? Intelligence. Because we are what? Intelligence. That means that we think what? Intelligence. We think what? Intelligence. We speak what? Intelligence. We speak what? Intelligence. We act what? Intelligence. We act what? Intelligence. At all what? Intelligence. At all what? Again, we don't perform, we breathe what? Life. So when we leave here, please don't say, I enjoyed your performance. Right. We're trying to save a life. And we're just asking that everybody in here hold yourself accountable. Because you also have an example to set. And I always tell the example setters, and including myself, I say, if the example that I'm setting, would it save a life or would it take a life? And then I move forward and I say I have to make a conscious decision to be positive, to be powerful, to be peaceful, so that we can all live in a world that we can say, I love myself and I, we believe in ourselves. Because we're all about breathing what? Life. life. Breathing what? Life. life. Breathe. Life. 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 Breathe. Breathe. Life. 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 Breathe. We set it positive examples, people everywhere we go. go. You can catch us in your city, breathing life at the corner stove. stove. Yeah, we young, ready, willing, just in case you didn't know. No. People think we are some Taylor song game matches, just we so. Set it positive examples, people, that's just who we uh. are. And we natural born, what is natural born? Superstars. Superstars. We was birth to breathe life, so anybody can get, get it. it. When it comes to saving lives, people, we are so committed. Woo! Breathe. Life. Life. Breathe. Breathe. Life. Life. Breathe. breathe. What that man can't be. What them style girl at? Hey. Everywhere on deck, if you don't know exactly set. Hey. Let the youth speak the truth. We gonna bring it in the raw. Oh. And there's nothing that we read, but it's everything we so. saw. Bring it law, rules, or this too. Everyone we meet, me. even when it's cold, I said example set. Bring, bring the heat. heat. And we do not accept the feet. We elite, so we went. Thug see us coming strong. Now like, there they go again. again. What? There they go again. again. Overstood, we don't stop. stop. Bring a lot of every block. block. We so ten toes that we, we cover, cover more than the stop. We so ten toes that we cover more than the stop. What more than a stop? People think we knew it before the we report the news a lot. We just setting the example just in case you forget. Breathe, life, life, breathe, breathe, life, life, breathe. Set it positive examples, people everywhere we go. You can catch us in your city, breathe our life at the corner. So yeah, we young ready, willing just in case you didn't know. People think we also tell us strong game message, just we so set it positive examples, people that's just who we are. If we natural born, with us natural born superstars. superstars. We was birthed to bring life, so anybody can get yeah. it. When it comes to saving lives, people we are so committed. Woo! Breathe, life, life, breathe, breathe, life, life, breathe. breathe. When you stand behind us, yes, it's okay to follow. follow. We gon' max and master today, cause we are not promised tomorrow. tomorrow. And we learn to do for self, so we don't always have to borrow. We just live and breathe in life, and we do this with no sorrow. What's the point of being average? Well, you should be great. great. Every day we breathe in life. We ain't got no time to waste. waste. Yeah, we represent the shop, but we travel state to state. We bringing flavor to the world like, like the, the icing on the cake. We bring the flavor to the world like the icing on the cake. Like, like the icing on the cake. We come to Max Mash, your man. Where's the 
work, we go shine. shine. Live and breathe in life. Yep. This is how we grind. Right. One block at a time. Shine. The nation getting healed. And how do y'all know it's Apple Let us be the sign. Breathe. Life. Life. Breathe. Breathe. Life. Life. Breathe. Breathe. Life. Life. Breathe. Could everybody repeat after us? I love myself. I love myself. I believe in myself. I believe in myself. I take pride. I take pride in what I say and what I say and do to myself. And do to myself because I respect myself. Because I respect myself. Because inside of me, because inside of me, I hold the key. I hold the key that unlocks the door. That unlocks the door to my success. To my success. I truly, I truly, and honestly, and honestly, without a doubt, without a doubt, love, love myself, myself, love, love myself, myself. Now we don't say that to be vain or to be conceited, but before you can love anyone or anything, you must first love your what? So. Then you can spread that love through the entire what? World. World. Having a positive effect on every man, woman, boy, and what? Girl. Girl. Remember, it is our responsibility and our duty to love ourselves. Want for yourself what you want for your brother and your sister. And what do you want for yourself? The very what? Best. best. The very what? Best. The very what? Best. But in order to have the best, you must think like the what? Best. Speak like the what? Best. And act like the what? Best. Not some of the time, but all the what? Time. Again, that's your responsibility. The example has been what? Set. The example has been what? Set. Set. All day. Every day. All day. Every day. Left face. Fall out. <laughs> Dominica is, um, Dr. McBride has been with uh, I Am Abel Trim from our inception and helped put our prototype together. She is a researcher, she has her own company, Become, and she has just been a life source for the work that we are doing here uh, on the west side of Chicago that will soon be expanding around our fair city. So would you please welcome our sister, our friend, and our Evaluation and Quality Assurance Leader for TRIM, Dr. Dominica McBride. Thank you, love. Hello, what a morning so far, right? My gosh, uh, when they said chills, I literally got goosebumps all over. It was, that was amazing. And it's amazing that um, this culture um, in its, <laughs> myriad facets of positive and negative um, characteristics that that can breed uh, something as great as that and then also the pain that they were talking about. Um, a few years ago I had a friend that told me that I was infected by this culture, American culture. And, uh, and I was like, what? <laughs> I prided myself, I'm being critical of the culture, I prided myself on valuing something that was opposite uh, American quote-unquote culture. I criticized how it valued money over meaning, uh, rates over relationships, callousness over community. Uh, we too often have facades in place of a true sense of family like what those youth were talking about. Uh, so when he said that I was infected by it, uh, I totally denied any truth to that. Um, about uh, Three years after he said that to me, I was reading this article on intelligence. And it was looking at the way Japanese culture saw intelligence versus American culture and how we see intelligence. And it said in Japanese culture, they see intelligence uh, as moldable, as shaped, as growing. They see mistakes as opportunities for growth and practice and hard work uh, as a way to cultivate intelligence. Versus here we see intelligence as inherent. You've either got it or you don't. 
mistakes are a way or are a show of what you don't know or of how you're lacking. Uh, and there's not much movement from there. And when I read that article and I saw how we defined intelligence, I was like, oh my God, I am affected by the culture because I had adopted that, the American definition of intelligence without even knowing it. I beat myself up around mistakes. I beat myself up when I, when I couldn't do something immediately, right after learning it, right? And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm infected too. And there's this joke uh, that shows how really we're all infected by the culture. Um, this old wise fish <laughs> was swimming around, these young fish, and the old wise fish says, my, isn't the water wonderful today? And the young fish say, water? What water? Okay, so I'll tell you. <laughs> so the water, uh, the, the young fish, they were young, right? They, did, they didn't, they weren't aware that there was this thing called water that was influencing everything that they did. That was uh, cold, sometimes warm, sometimes they were breathing it in, they were spitting it out. They, it was influencing so much. And the old wise fish had been around and had started to observe this thing that she couldn't really see, but knew it was there and it was influencing everything. That's culture. It affects every one of us. And in this culture, there's a lot of falsehoods that developed and that's why we're here because this culture has created what we're seeing today, what we're dealing with on a daily basis. A lot of times we can't see it, but it's affecting so much of what every single one of us think do, how we decide, how we live out our days, what we say, how we say it. And so today, part of the purpose of today is to start to see those waters and do something about it. So we have a great group of panelists here uh, who are going to share what they do and how they do what they do to address this. So. You each have, will have three minutes each, first round. Um, please tell us your name, where you're from, and what is your strategy for countering the miseducation or filling in the gaps of the missed education of our community? Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody going, doing today? I'm so glad that we're sitting down and we're talking about education and literacy because that is so much power for us and that is so much uh, the thing that's going to turn all of our ships around if we grasp it and get it. Um, I just went to a fair last week and what I noticed now, uh, people, I'm in the life and financial industry, I'm sorry, my name is Bernard Scott. and what I do primarily is bring financial literacy to the workplace. So I work a lot with the Chicago Public Schools and other school systems and, and small businesses as well. But in my contact with people, I know how much information is missing, how much we need it, how much we don't have because guess what? Generations before us didn't have it and before them. So one of my solutions is number one, when I'm talking to my clients or prospective clients or people in workshops, is to know that I'm not talking just to that one person. I'm talking to them and a generation coming behind them and their families and their friends and their neighbors. So I look at like anything else spreads, I wanna break old chains. We have some bad old chains of information or non-information. So the whole thing is literacy, financial literacy is so important that we create new chains. I tell everybody, I got a grandson who's uh, six years old. I put something in place for him early on at that age. My kids when they're in college, I put something in place for them. Not to say that they know all what it is, but it's in place. So now down the line, I'm gonna explain as it goes 
time goes on, they get older, what it is. So now they get a financial head start, number one. So we got to start looking at our young people and saying, they can't start at the same place we started up. 99% of, of us are playing catch up. Some are 30, some are 40, some are 50, some are 60. Some in retirement, we're playing catch up. When you fight that hard to get behind, it makes it so hard because the older you get, the more you got to do. And it comes to a point, I hear a lot of people say, I'm too old, it's too late for me. And I tell them, it's not too late, nothing stops. Guess what, you're going to retirement, it doesn't stop. Things keep continuing to go. So the whole thing is, be by, financial, by being financial literate, you know what your options are. The more options you have, the, more, the better decisions you can make. But going back to my point, I went to a, uh, it was a church in my area, and it was, a panel of, it was a panel of people that came out to the church. And it was sponsored by the state, and it connected with the church. And what it was is a panel of people, vendors like this, and everybody did workshops, and everybody had tables. But the thing about it is I see more of that coming to the different communities because it's needed very badly. And where do you get it? You don't get it at the workplace. You don't get it in school. So that's why we're playing catch up because now we're getting to our 30s and 40s and now the light bulb is going off. You miss 5, 10, 15 years of planning and putting things in place. So my thing is to join, I'm going to pass it down. My thing is to join more of these type of panels and, and boards to bring more of this kind of information to different communities so everybody kind of gets this information and we got a leg up now because we're getting information that we didn't have before. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Walter McCray. I'm a, a minister of uh, a number of decades, and uh, yeah, <laughs> the uh, I'm a I'm a writer and a publisher, uh, publishing through Black Light Fellowship, and it's written over twenty something volumes. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very much involved in uh, uh, combating illiteracy and uh, in, on, on that level and miseducation, miseducation. Primarily, uh, I'm here, and uh, we applaud this uh, trauma conference. I'm here dealing with a, a particular little book that each of you should have in your packet if you have not, you can get that. It's called Get Grown and Keep Growing, the Self-Help Adult Maturity Handbook. And I want to correct some miseducation from our level in terms of what does it really mean to be an adult and mature. That is, uh, b going from being a minor, which is under uh, 18, to being a major, which is 18 and over. And we explore adult maturity in 16 different areas. Uh, legitimacy, money, self-perception, responsibility, value, stance, will, feelings, body and mind, identity, home life, associates, government, people, world life view, and faith commitment. We have a little test of adult maturity, the truth of adult maturity, and the triumph of adult maturity in this little handbook. We've seen it change the life of some young people in about 15 minutes when they began to take the test of adult maturity there. Uh, of course, I go in, in depth into a couple of areas. One is uh, stance, and, and that is what kind of attitude do, does a young person bring a positive attitude as they're maturing through life? Many of our young people faced a trauma that many of them don't expect to reach the age of 18 or the age of 21 because of the violence, the rampant violence that's in the community. And we're, we have a message of hope and say to them, uh, yes, you, you can make it to 18, be successful, make it past 18, all right? I wrote one little book called Black Cherry Rising Black Cherry Rising. Miss Cherry has a fall. She goes through some drama and changes. Then she rises back. And that book has connected with many young people and young adults, all right, to give them hope. One final thing is, oh, I, 
right on cue. <laughs> I deal with biblical literacy. Many of our young people don't understand their history. Many of us don't understand our history as far as it's communicated through biblical literature. So I've written a, a, a double set on the black and African presence in the Bible. And so we go way back and try to establish the identity of, of black people as viewed through the windows of biblical literature, history, geography, and culture. All right? A lot of our young people, a lot of our people feel lost and meaningless. Many feel that our history began in slavery. And we're trying to tell folk, no, our history began thousands of years before slavery. We come from kings and queens and princesses and prophets, wise men, etc. All right? And this helps alleviate some of the trauma. Understanding our biblical, cultural, African history from the spiritual roots of a great book called the Bible. Good afternoon, uh, Eric K. Williams. Uh, I am, uh, I'm actually from the Austin community, grew up in Austin community. I actually own an insurance and investment agency in downtown Chicago called Empowerment Resources International. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Vessel, as well I, as well as I am able. And part of uh, how our organization uh, helps with this strategy is is really by being examples to the community. Uh, I, um, I do second everything he said about the Bible. It's one of the best books in the world in reference to teaching. Yeah. And so part of it, obviously, is it, it kind of starts here. You know, we. The Bibles got removed from the schools and all, the, all that history on that, but this is one of the most important books that we uh, have to get families involved in. So, uh, but our organization tries to be the example. Uh, we, uh, again, owning a, an insurance and investment advisory agency uh, in, in the community or in Chicago, one of the things that we do is we often have workshops on, a, on, a, on a, several workshops on a monthly basis. Uh, part of our mission is to educate uh, communities about all of their options in reference to preparing for their future, uh, avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that take place or that are, that are available right now. Um, we like working with mature people because again, uh, a lot of our parents uh, have made a lot of mistakes. And so, although the youth are important, uh, I think the adults are just as important uh, because they, they, you know, um, they made it happen, so I'm excited about that. They made it happen. They took care. I come from a, a single home with one uh, mom who didn't graduate high school and three sisters, so a family of four, uh, single parent family of four in the hood. So nobody, everyone's heard that story before. But just by being the education, all the people that sacrificed to, you know, obviously help me get an education, graduate college, start a business, et cetera. But part of our uh, solution really is just bringing forth uh, information. Uh, really, we got to get our communities to take an interest in wealth. We're in the, we're in the wealth industry, and um, we do that really by educating. Uh, we do that by educating uh, our communities about really all of the options. If if you work a if we work a job right now, every employer in America grows your money in the stock market. But if I were to take a poll right now and ask you uh, what percentage of your money you felt comfortable gambling versus keeping more safe and conservative, most people would say, I'd like to have pretty much all of it safe and conservative, or, or you know, I don't want to lose. But you know, every day, millions of people uh, put their hard-earned life savings, their kids' college funds, and all those things in systems that are not as advantageous for us. So one of the things we do is we educate you about the universe of options that are available to you. Uh, stop out at our table and take some information or come to our workshop, but thank you. 
Hi, my name is Love McPherson. I'm a relationship expert. And guess what? There is a lot of misinformation in the area of relationships. And, you know, I when I am trying to re-educate, now, now think about that. That really is my name, Love McPherson. So, of course, I grew up to talk about love, right? Um, but what I would like to say is when we ask the question of misinformation, my mis the misinformation that I have to correct a lot of times goes very broad because I have to work with um, and uh, reinform uh, the single woman to let them know that there is not the lack of black men uh, in our culture that a lot of times is portrayed to be. In fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, that is basically about a six to eight percent disparity. And so when you look and, and most people believe it's higher, there becomes an anxiousness. There's ability to sell you products that you don't need. There's ability to make you feel like you are competing against other races and other kind, and there becomes this battle. There becomes this resentment of you didn't choose me. There becomes the rewounding of the rejection and those different issues. Then we have to speak to the, uh, in our cultures, a lot of times I have to uh, re-inform the, the single black men and even married black men to, to, to realize that the spreading of your seed is not the manhood, but the spreading, but the quality of planting is, is, is where it's at. And then uh, for married couples, what I, and, and I work with married couples a lot, one of the things that I have to really get them to see, and this is why this trauma conference is so important, is because a lot of times in marriage, we will look at what is happening in our marriages. We will see a response that is aggressive or a response that is, is, is a, a tongue lashing or a, a response that really hurts us and re sticks their finger in the wounds of, of, of our trauma. And we will determine that's love. If you loved me, you wouldn't be doing, doing that. You need to know what you are looking at when you see what you see. A lot of times you are just simply looking at a trauma response. Some Somebody is loving you as best they can, but yet you have to look at that and say, no, I separate myself from this. This is a response to trauma. Now you have to decide, are you there for the healing process? And that's what love is. Love gives. Love offers healing love. And so those mis the, the misinformation that I am coming in here to be rescued, somebody's going to see my corpse and kiss it, and I'm going to come back to life, that's not going to happen. Okay, and so what you have to do is realize if I'm going to commit to love, I'm committing to giving, not committing to just taking. That's what I like to do. Uh, it's going to be hard to follow that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Xavier Ramey. Um, I served on two fronts. One, I'm the Senior Assistant Director for Social Innovation and Philanthropy over at the University of Chicago. Um, I also serve as the Operations Director for the Let Us Breathe Collective. Those are very, very different and very distinct organizations. One is obviously an academic institution, and the other one uh, takes on the work of reimagining society outside of punitive solutions uh, for black and brown communities here in the city. Um, and so a lot of the question around miseducation, um, academically, um, I do that primarily in a hyper-elite college. Uh, where most of the people don't look like me. Um, very few come from backgrounds like my own, which was here in the community of Lawndale, where I lived up until about a year and a half ago. Um, and communicating oftentimes the very pains and experiences and statistics that have affected and still do affect my own life. Um, and communicate that into in a way that people understand their role in it as they're also simultaneously being groomed to be the next leaders of the free world, as they're often told. Um, and to do that in such a way that it does not create the mental and emotional um, and psychological paralysis that often comes with getting woke. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of a daunting process, I find, but it's one that I engage heartily. Uh, the other part is with the Let Us Breathe Collective. Um, you all probably haven't heard much about us, and that's on purpose. Um, a lot of our work is more subversive. We work primarily uh, to dismantle um, and, and also to reimagine what security and safety looks like for black people. We do that by taking direct action against the Chicago Police Department, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, as well as the Cook County Sheriff's Department. And when we think about those types of institutions, 
that's usually the response that we get in the black community in terms of what is the way that we can heal and restore the black community. Uh, it's by bringing more guns in. Um, it's by reinforcing trauma, but doing it through tax funded opportunities um, like like prisons, like police. Um, and so we look to re-engage that, uh, one, by taking that head on, by illuminating where the misconceptions around that as a, as a viable solution for us, but obviously not a viable solution for other people living in the city of Chicago, far away from communities like Lawndale and Austin and Auburn, Gresham and Inglewood, um, but also creating the alternative because it's, it's, it is a cruel thing to tell someone you shouldn't have this, you shouldn't do this and not provide an alternative for them. Um, and so in that, we have a space in the back of the yards community. Uh, it's about 4,000 square feet where we create intentional community with people in the community of, of back of the yards, Inglewood, um, Auburn Gresham, Gage Park, Lawndale, et cetera, um, to talk about things just like this, this trauma conference, um, as well as to provide Know Your Rights seminars and trainings uh, to create opportunities for people to understand uh, not only what uh, things cost, but also how to have community and cooperative economics um, as a foundational element of our community. And, and, and a lot of that is, is because of, I believe we're in a different time now. Um, and in much of the same way that, that you know, black folks, we love to talk about soul food and these types of things, nostalgia is the death of ambition. Um, we can see that with the Make America Great Again stuff. I mean, it really will destroy us if we get too nostalgic at the wrong time. Um, and so we have to shift the way we think about not only where we are, um, but what we must be for this time um, in order to create a better time for those we say we care about who will come after us. Thank you. Well, yes, uh, uh oh. I, am I good? All right, all right. Appreciate it. Uh, well, first and foremost, so just appreciate being here, uh, being able to talk about uh, trauma. Uh, uh, my name is Eli Williamson. I'm the co-founder of a not-for-profit called Leave No Veteran Behind. What we do is we invest in veterans uh, to build better communities. We, I, don't, I look at vet, the veteran community as a community of assets, individuals that have basically been trained to s some form of a standard and that our larger community can call on because they've been trained to standard. Now, to answer this question, a strategy for countering miseducation of our community, I'm, I'm, uh, Dominica knows me a little bit in the sense that I'm a uh, contrarian. I think one of the things that we have to stop doing is talking about what we don't know, all right? And I, I just find it strange that uh, our nation, right, which loves our music, you know, uh, loves our culture, except for when we're doing it. Um, I'm sorry, that's too much. All right. <laughs> But, um, but, but I find it strange that all the things that we've been able to do to be able to survive and exist in an environment that sometimes and even now is very hostile to us, I find it strange that we don't actually articulate what we've learned and the things that we do know from that experience. So when people talk about trauma, very rarely do we talk about risk, right? Very rarely do we talk about risk. Because when we talk about risk, it's the, it's, it, we actually have to acknowledge that a system or the environment that you're in is unfair. Fundamentally, if you're talking about risk and trauma, you're not saying, okay, I'm traumatized because somebody's doing things wrong. We're saying somebody will do something wrong and I have to manage those risks. Now, everybody in this room has made it to this location today. And I imagine by making it here today, you have analyzed and addressed several risk factors that will keep you from making it here today. It, true or false? If there's one thing that black folk know how to do well, translation, if there's one thing that black folk know how to do well is manage risk. Now, what is the size of the risk management business across the world? Now, we're in a health-related enterprise right now. In order for this enterprise to be built and designed, they had to do a risk study, right? They had to understand what's the risk to the community. Every day when these folks come here, they have to understand what type of risk it is to run this operation. But if you look at the risk management field, and if you look at people who are doing risk for us, for anybody else, how are we represented in those fields? And we manage risk every day. We even have a language of risk, right? So if somebody starts running, we just start running because, right? I mean, we got jokes galore about risk, right? And we, we can talk all the time about the risk that we face, but yet and still, we're not in that industry. Right? We don't even talk about mathematics. We don't talk about reading. We don't talk about our education from a risk standpoint, right? Even though that's a language that we can commonly share and have long discussions about. So I, I get financial planning. I get, you know, taking on police and, and, and I get all of that stuff. But if we're not leaning on the cultural values that we actually have, right, then I'm just, I, 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 I'm unsure of the ability of us to learn a new language 
that allows us to manage risk going forward, which will lead to more trauma as well. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Dr. Vessel uh, for the invitation here. I'm very humbled uh, to be here. Um, this is, I'm a little bit of, of a fish out of water. <laughs> this isn't something I'm accustomed to. Uh, my name is Stanley Williams, and I'm a Chicago firefighter. Uh, 31 years, actually. I'm a captain. Uh, I've been uh, on this side of the city working for over 15 years of my, of my career. Um, I'm one of those get down dirty kind of people. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I love children, I love young people. Uh, we get on the ground and we draw, you know, hot scotch, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's how we do it. Um, you know, this, this, I'm hoping as I, as I sit here and I was listening to the other panelists that I'm humbled to be uh, in the company with, that I'm able to give you guys some value. Because um, what I have to share is just pretty much my walk, my life, you know, what's happened in my life. Uh, being uh, a proud resident of Chicago and working in the streets of Chicago um, for over 31 years, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of trauma. That, you know, we're using the word trauma. And as I've been here this morning, um, I know trauma is relative, you know. And I've seen trauma in, in a lot of ways. Um, that uh, a lot of you wouldn't want to, you know, you want to unsee, you wish you didn't see that. But you can't unsee something. Um, I love prevention. Some of the things that I saw happen to people, I, 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 man, I wish we could have done something so that wouldn't happen again. So to answer this question about miseducation, it's the same way to me, I think it's a simple question. The way you conquer hate is with love. The way you conquer miseducation is with education, good education. And, uh, and, and, and for, for me and my walk and my life, what I've, what I've been doing here for, you know, in the city as a, as a public servant, I'm always educating people and I try to do it through humor. Uh, sometimes I do it through controlled anger, like I'm frustrated. You know, I, I go into someone's home and they have burglar bars with a padlock on it. And I have to be frustrated with them to say, what if there's a fire here? Oh, I can just go get the key. I said, go get it. And then they go look somewhere. They, <laughs> they have no idea that smoke is going to choke your breath right out of your body. You won't have time to go look for a key. And then when you do come back, guess where that key is? It's on a ream of keys. <laughs> and this is a reality, and I try to share with people and help them to basically just see their situation. Um, and so I've, I've been pretty successful in that. Uh, I've, I've embraced uh, some relationships with people. Um, I was here um, at the fire station, actually here on, on California, right up, right, you know, right up the street. And uh, a, a little boy came in my station one day and we, you know, we got connected and a relationship came out of it. And, started traveling and took them to Disney and with my kids and everything. And it was, it was awesome to be involved in someone's life, but there was so much trauma going on in his personal life that it was, it was, it was sad, you know, to say, hey, why do you have a wound on your arm? Oh, I got bit by my pet rat. By your what? <laughs> you know, no bed. You know, just the things. We've heard the stories about things that happen to people. So, um, my thought is, what could I do to make a difference in someone else's life? And as uh, Sister Love here just said, give. We, I, I know what's in it for me. Usually when someone asks you, you to do something, how much am I gonna get paid or what's in it for me? Forget about what's in it for you, give. Just give. And guess what? You'll reap more satisfaction after, uh, uh, from giving to someone than, than taking. So I'm hoping that I could leave value with, uh, with everyone here today. And actually, I, and I just wanna, I'm gonna close here. Uh, I hope I can leave you some value because, because of what I've seen, this has been an object lesson for me and I've actually moved into understanding some things about finances and, uh, and a strategy that can be implemented to help uh, overcome some of the common things that happens in all households. For example, uh, my, my daughter, she's in college and, as well as my son. 
both of them, I have them funded in college absolutely free. They'll have no debt. They're going to graduate from college, and at the end of their college, they'll have no student loans at all, and they'll have wealth. And I'd love to share that information with you, so that's why, why I'm here, and I hope that uh, you guys will attend my <laughs> workshop, and I can give the value, and hopefully it will help you out. God bless you all. Good afternoon, my name is Joanna J. and as you guys can see, I'm not like, the, not that I'm different, but I don't own like a Fortune 500 company. Um, um, no, I, <laughs> not yet, yeah, better, better word. Um, I'm from Mikva Challenge, I'm from the South Side of Chicago, but I do attend um, high school on the West Side of Chicago at Crane, y'all probably know where Crane is, it's not that far. Oh, okay, crane gang. Um, so yeah, I, I'm proud to um, be from Chicago. I consider myself um, an expert at the city, not not that, because I lived here my whole life. My, I got family from different parts of the city, and I love being from Chicago. Don't matter where I go, I rep Chicago. When I stay the bra, I'm Chicago crazy. I love the city, but I want to see a lot of things change. Um, so I want to go back to what Mr. Williamson said. Um, I loved everything you talked about. And since I have, I have a platform to a certain extent because I go to school with young people from a different parts of the city. And I just want to um, mention what he said about acknowledging. And I feel like that's how I, my, my platform that I have right now, that's how I address the miseducation of our community because sometimes a lot of us, especially young people and young black people, we're so uncomfortable to talk about certain things. We don't want to acknowledge that there's a system in place because we don't want to we don't we don't want to um feel that we want to be like oh our grandparents they already handled that we get so uncomfortable we don't want to acknowledge that chicago is segregated we don't want to acknowledge that once you go past the 126 bus in certain directions it change and we feel so comfortable because we want to be comfortable we want to um feel like this is our country. We have pride to be an Americans. Um, but sometimes we um, we just don't want to talk about it. And I feel like that's that's how I'm countering the miseducation of people. Because when I go to school and it's Hispanic people at my school, I want to have those conversations. Where does your, what, where does the rail line go past Roosevelt? Because people don't know. It goes to the south side because they don't ride the train past that certain point if you live in certain communities. We want to talk about why is why um Winnie Young down the street is so differently funded from my school? And that's just how I counter it. I want to have those conversations because we can't fix anything if we don't acknowledge it. And that's the thing people don't get. Um, yeah, so I'm going to close out because I'll start going crazy. <laughs> um, but I just want to talk about how um, I did I, last year. I lived in Europe. Um, in Spain and Italy for a while. And what I learned there that this is just not a Chicago problem. This is not just an American problem. I met so many different people. This happened in all parts of the country. In uh, all parts of the world when um, black people been oppressed in our, uh, South Africa, I met so many South Africans. And it's just a conversation that needs to be had so we can actually fix it. So I'm gonna move on. Hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Vessel. Hi. Um, my name is Laura. I run an organization called Traffic Free, and that's spelled T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K, free. Um, but we're an anti-human trafficking organization, and I want to also make sure that when we talk about anti-human trafficking, we're talking about um, both sex and labor trafficking in general. Obviously, we will not be talking about labor trafficking today, but um, I get to, if you want to find out more, um, I will be at the workshop with Love um, this afternoon about relationships. But when we talk about um, uh, miseduca miseducation, I think our education platforms have two different audiences. One are the um, self-identified females that we serve, both cis and transgender females um, that we serve, as well as the public, um, which you know, I'm assuming you know, most of you guys are the public. And I think for the women that, um, <clears throat> for the women that we serve through our relational support, um, as well as our drop-in center, which you can find out more about that on our website, um, one of the biggest things that we want to make sure women know is that they have the power to make a choice. And so women continue to stay engaged um, in the life, and as, as well as obviously men and boys. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of resources for them, but we're also ready to provide those 
for men and boys, but for women specifically, um, a lot of women, regardless of whether or not they have a pimp or a trafficker, um, stay in the life because they feel like they have no other choice. And so we want to make sure that women know that even when they come to the drop-in center, they have 100% autonomy in everything that they choose to do at our drop-in center. They can choose a shower. They can choose their shampoo. They can choose their conditioner. They can choose which couch they want to you know, crash on for a little bit. Um, they can choose the food. We don't have prepared food and say, this is our meal for tonight. Um, so we want to make sure that everything that we do at our drop-in center and the services that we provide outside the drop-in center is about empowering <clears throat> And as for the public, and I'm sorry, I'm actually getting over a nasty cough for the last week, um, but for the public, I think there's so much education that we have out there. Um, you'll never hear me use words like prostitute to refer to somebody because we need to drop that word. We need to drop phrases like, I'm gonna pimp out my car. That's not cool. You don't dress like a pimp for Halloween. You don't dress like a horrific abuser. Um, you know, you don't, you drop those words, but even sometimes, you know, one of the things that struck me, and I am a Christian, um, you know, love my Jesus, but at the same time, I think one of the things that we also are very careful with at, um, at Traffic Free is that we are in it to do emergency services, so we don't bring up the Bible, we don't bring up Jesus, because a lot of times we know that traffickers have used those platforms to, um, to groom their victims, and so we don't bring it up until she brings it up first. Um, and so a lot of that is also training our volunteers and training the general public that as much as you love Jesus, that's great. I'm going to ask you to keep that to yourself right now. Um, and so, and also talking about, you know, how we blame, um, we all know that uh, women of color are disproportionately affected by every social injustice out there, yet too often um, we blame, uh, especially black women, for the violence that's perpetrated against them. So we also have this platform to educate the public that, no, let's, let's look at all the isms that, that um, promote human trafficking, um, that promote human trafficking. So um, my three minutes are up. I usually have two hours at least to talk about human trafficking. So um, come to our uh, breakout session this afternoon on relationships if you want to find out more. Thank you. My name is Walida Bennett. I'm the director of the Multi-Faith Veteran Initiative that's housed at DePaul University. And basically what we try to do is connect the faith community with behavioral health providers on a platform to engage community around transition issues uh, with veterans. Eli and I are partners in crime in this um, endeavor. Th this is a very interesting question when you start talking about what strategies are for encountering miseducation of the community. I think that before you can develop a strategy, you have to understand what you're de developing the strategy for. Um, this notion of miseducation, is it miseducation or is it a non-acknowledgement of what I know? Which is an entirely different question. Oftentimes when we talk about trauma, when we talk about traffic, when we talk about any of these issues, if we talk about wealth, it's not a lack of wealth. Wealth comes in a multitude of Eggs. We look at wealth only in terms of finances. So when we talk about developing a strategy, a miseducation strategy, what is the strategy? We need to deconstruct the word. We are born with knowledge. It's unconscious, but we know it. It reveals itself very quickly. At what point does it become miseducation? Words are very powerful. The word miseducation itself can lead to trauma because it indicates it's something that I am not informed of or incorrectly informed of. Is it that we are incorrectly informed of it? Or is it that the context in which that education takes place is a missed context? Fundamentally different. So before we can develop a strategy, we need to deconstruct the word. Good almost afternoon or afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with a question. My name is Jaleel abdul -Adil. I'm from the University of Illinois, Chicago. How many of you out there are therapists or clinicians? How many of you out there are healers? I hope everybody's hand just went up. 
because that's the focus of what we do at the University of North Chicago Urban Youth Trauma Center. We work hand in hand with the community building on its strengths, and I have had the pleasure of working in communities similar to Lawndale, Inglewood, used to work in Cabrini Green, Robert Taylor Homes, uh, Ida B. Wells, all those communities which have been so beautiful to me to educate me and I've worked in tandem with them to build on their strengths while sharing mine. And I'm very happy to say that in working with trauma, we have never gone into a community that does not have a unique set of strengths and gifts. And you have to have a strength-based mentality to be able to tap into those gifts because part of the re-education process that we don't talk about is we have to re-educate the people who have the education. That includes us with the so-called higher degrees, and instead of always focusing on school degrees, we try to focus on also street degrees, wisdom, uh, spanning the ages, the races, the ethnicities. I guess since I'm the token Muslim on the panel, uh, religions. <laughs> Shout out to the Quran too. Um, and, and as far as we're concerned, we do need creative approaches. And um, a few things, because I don't want that little bell to start sounding. So I made a few notes. As far as our workshop, we really believe you have to know the political system and historical trauma that has impacted communities so you can really understand the problem to begin to solve it. We also believe that all of us can play a role in being a protective web around ourselves, our children, and our communities because we all have something to contribute once we understand trauma and once we understand missed education and missed education. I also want to encourage us to really appreciate what we saw with the youth because I primarily work with youth, uh, primarily those who are involved with gangs, uh, who are involved with substance use and abuse and community violence. Because the, as, as the uh, youth showed us today, you can use some very creative approaches like spoken word to reach out and get the message from the youth to the youth. And that's something we all should think about, meeting them where they are to get them where they need to go. And we'll also be learning along the way. I have a program called uh, Hip Hop Heals, which focuses on rap, hip hop, spoken word, and all the hip hop cultural components to deliver these same traditional messages that we do, but in a creative, engaging way that's stimulating for the youth, it keeps us on our toes. Because whether we like to acknowledge it or not, youth know. And if you don't know, youth know. So I'll close out by inviting you to uh, the panel that I'll be working on, which will be the politics of miseducation and miseducation, how it impacts us as a community. We'll focus on historical trauma. And I'll make a final note that if you're looking to come here, a dynamic speaker, share his or her expertise, don't come. <laughs> but if you are coming to share your expertise and collaborate as a community so we all can learn, I look forward to seeing you. All right. Thank you, everybody. That, those are awesome introductions. So we wanted to make sure that there was time for you to get some of your questions answered. Um, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, unfortunately, just a couple, uh, if we want to jump in to, to lunch. All right. Uh, so just to give a quick review, because I know that was a lot to take in all at once, we have financial literacy, religion and history, uh, wealth, investments, relationships, criminal justice and academics, risk management, youth, human trafficking, uh, veterans, neurolinguistics, and healing are the topics that are represented I'm sure much more um, <laughs> than that. Uh, so, questions? Um, to the, the gentleman on the end, um, could you speak to a little bit, I, I'm actually in graduate school right now, um, getting my Master's of Education in Youth Development, and I. Um, doing some research on, on hip hop. And could you kind of speak to, over time, uh, briefly, the, the um, demonization and underutilization of the hip hop phenomenon and, and um, how that could be beneficial to us who work with youth in terms of utilizing it? Full disclosure, uh, I've been working with rap and hip hop since 1989. 
So I'm an OG hip hopper, hip hop head. Uh, and to keep it very real with you then, we have to embrace selected and strategic songs and videos. And if they're the so-called uh, comparison between conscious radical rap uh, and the gangster rap, then we want to juxtapose the two and show how those messages often are, are um, can be compared to show what's right while we acknowledge the struggles that we have. I'll give you a quick example of Tupac, which everybody usually knows. Uh, I encourage you to go see the movie All Eyes on Me. He struggled, his family struggled, but he had a revolutionary spirit while he also had some personal challenges. And so when we can embrace the hip hop culture with its strengths and its weaknesses and challenges, and be able to show youth that you have a range of options, point to some success stories like Snoop Dogg, who came out of prison and is now a multimillionaire. Also, you talk about uh, a convicted, well, not convicted, uh, publicly convicted heroin dealer who gets invited to the White House, Jay-Z, right? But you also talk about all the ones who didn't make it because they were making choices. And our, our issue is use rap and hip hop, selected strategic rap and hip hop, to use those examples to teach and share messages. And also, we learning from things that go on in hip hop culture way before it might get to us parents. So it's an exchange, and there's a model that you can use where you identify the selected and strategic videos, songs, uh, movies, commercials, uh, spoken word, uh, dance therapy, and other things which are stimulating for the youth and educational for everybody in the form of edutainment. But use selected strategic. You all did hear me say that, right? Selected strategic. Because uh, it's a lot out there, and I'll stop with that. Thank you. I want to know what selective project or plan can be used to help not only the generation now, but for the generation in the future and finances to secure, I know the fireman mentioned um, his children coming out without paying any uh, any uh, college bills, but in later years, residual uh, funding to help them in life. I'm sorry, we, we've got a, a poll between us, so I'm not being rude because I can't see you, but I, I, do, I did hear your voice. Um, thank you for addressing that. Uh, back to me um yeah I, it, it's uh i give all the honor to god <laughs> that that was uh information came to me because as all of us are are doing we're just trying to raise our families we're trying to keep everybody healthy and happy that's what we're trying to do and um it, it was pretty much a strategy a strategy that you know because people are usually down on what they're not up on you know what i mean if they never heard about it you know <laughs> they usually don't have anything good to say about it because, you know, you just don't know. So uh, basically that's what I'm going to talk about in my workshop. I'm going to talk about strategy and just let you know some things you can do as the, as, as, as the young lady here, and I'm sorry, sister, I didn't remember your name, but the young lady, Juanita? Walita. Walita. She so eloquently uh, stated that um, we just need to make sure that we, uh, you know, we have a have a real strategy for what we're trying to do. Basically, so I'm just just uh, paraphrasing what she said. You basically have to have a strategy for what you're doing, and so that's what I'm going to share. I'm going to share a strategy on actually how you can do some things to basically just change some things around. You already have wealth. All of us already have wealth in our homes. We just don't, you know, think about it. If you just add up all of your stuff, <laughs> how many people put things on let go? How many offer up? You know. Uh, Craigslist, whatever. How many, you know, and when you, you know, you need some money, we can get rid of some of the stuff that we have in our house and we can get some money to do stuff, you know. That's, so I'm just letting you know, we have it, we just have to put it in the right place so that it can actually work for us properly to accomplish our goal. All right, so one more question, and please, if you have more questions, come up and talk to them after the panel. Well, let's give everybody a hand. Thank you so much for sharing and for being here. And
health and knowledge. Thank you, Dr. D. Okay, a lot of information, right? We're gonna be the better when we leave. We're gonna leave here with strategies and we're going to change some things in our worlds, beginning in our own lives and in the lives of those we impact.